Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another thrill-packed edition of the Jim Cornette Experience, where today on the program, my figures are in action. We're going to give you an update on my latest mental breakdown. Plus, we're going to talk about ridiculousness in the WWE and childishness in AEW. And we'll have a special interview with FanFest pioneer, promoter, and author of the new book, Matt Memories, our old friend John Arezzi. But joining me to do all this and even less, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you, the man who taught Warren Buffett everything he knows, the great Brian Last. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again. Of course, I'm someone who has a lot of respect and admiration for the Oracle of Omaha. I did not teach him anything, but I've learned a lot from his philosophies on investing. The Oracle of Omaha, Mad Dog Vashon or... or uh, Warren Buffett. Ernie Dusick. Warren Buffett. Oh, war- yeah, as I mentioned him earlier. Uh, I don't know whether to wind my ass or scratch my watch. I'm verklempt. I'm bum-fuzzled. I... I- <sighs> We might as well lead with this. I've had a hectic few days, Brian, and you've you've been updated on some of this. As a matter of fact, you placed a phone call to me <laughs> on Thursday morning when I was in the middle of screaming at people about shit, and uh, <laughs> it, it 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 started there, and it's it's dovetailed. Um, yeah, my favorite part about that was I must have called you mid promo, for lack of a better term, and the first thing I hear is. Oh, you could hear this, and then you just kept going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, no, hello. Just, you can hear this too, and those motherfuckers. <laughs> what happened earlier this week? Well, you know, my new my name my team. He's my team now, Hotchkiss Featherbuck, and he's doing a wonderful job. And I suggested to Hotchkiss. I said, "Why don't you set up?" Your own email on uh, here in the Jim Cornette Empire, your own in office email for uh, official Jim Cornette stuff, and you can keep it separate that way. Well, that's wonderful. And he did that. And his email, he could email people, and I could email people, but I couldn't email him, and he couldn't email me. Our emails didn't like each other. And because he called me up, he said, Well, did you get my new email? I said, No. And so he goes fiddling around. He said, well, I've got to call GoDaddy. And and first of all, by the way, when I was drug kicking and screaming into having email back in what was 2009, when the website went up and, and my life changed for the worse, I entered the computer age. Um, they said, Stacey said, oh, yeah, we got the email with GoDaddy. I'm GoDaddy? I said, shouldn't it be like International Email Corporation? As something that sounds reputable and 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 accomplished and and stable is to go, Daddy. All these fucking go, Daddy. PayPal. How about International Sending Money Company? Something that has some fucking gravitas to it, right? Anyway, so he calls these people, and they, oh yes, well, we see the problem. We can fix that. Bing, bing. Okay, thank you. So he thinks he got it fixed, right? Well, then he sends me an email. So Thursday morning, he comes over to the castle because we're going to shoot the cameos. And and uh, and by the way, everybody was happy, I believe, from what I've heard the feedback so far on the cameos. We appreciate Apparently, I have more people now in my fan club than anybody on Cameo but Floyd Mayweather. That's what they were saying. I don't know. But he's been on there eight months. Anyway. So we're going to shoot the cameos. Well, as Hotchkiss is setting up the equipment and everything, he's he just says, he, well, you got my email, right? I said, no, I didn't see it. I looked real briefly because it's early in the morning. I've showered, got my hair all done, ready to be on camera. So I go over and I check my email, and I didn't get an email from him. As a matter of fact, there's Thursday morning. I haven't gotten an email on that account since Wednesday afternoon. Well, that's unusual. Well, I got a few of them. Have to. I have several emails, so I've checked the other. No, I got I haven't gotten an email on any account since the previous Wednesday afternoon when they fixed things. Especially and including the orders to the Cornet's Collectibles customers at jimcornet.com. I get an email notifying me what they've bought and where to set all that stuff. I ain't getting that. Now, and by the way, if you did order on Wednesday afternoon, don't panic. This turns out well for you. 
But meanwhile, I'm tearing my hair out of my head. So anyway, I said, what the fuck? They've, they've shut my shit down, right? I should have shut my, then I'm starting to think, you know, God damn it. Every time either the website blows up or the, the people calls, Hey, your site's off the air. Cause something needed updated in a fucking system somewhere. Or, or we need more server or whatever. This is chaos. And you know, Brian, nobody, nobody in the world loathes computers, internet, websites, technology more than me because I have no fucking clue how any of this shit works, what happens with it. There's no instruction book comes with any of this shit. You're just supposed to know. And I don't know whether you need a claw hammer, a blender, or a roll of duct tape to build these things, which is why I finally got Hotchkiss. But in the in the meantime, with this now, I'm like, wait a minute, I'm putting these action figures on sale here very shortly. People are going to be ordering. I'm not going to know what's going on. Nobody can contact me. This knucklehead can just shut my shit down remotely. What the fuck? Of course, this is wild. Hotchkiss is trying to call and and get customer service. He can't get the guy he talked to yesterday. That's not possible. So he has to tell the new guy what the other guy did. And then, of course, the new guy has to take the responsibility to go in and figure out what the fucking guy fucked up. Blah, blah, blah. This is, And I'm like, we should have shut this whole bunch of shit down over Christmas. Fuck it. So finally... After an hour or something on the phone with this guy, and they're speaking in words that I have never heard before and rattling numbers off to each other, and my heart's palpitating and my head's hurting. I'm having an anxiety attack. Finally, he gets it fixed, and the emails start coming through again. Well, now it's way past noon. We haven't even started on these 50 cameo videos, and I did I mention I was having palpitations and head pains? I said, fuck it, we're re-racking this, we're going to shoot these cameos tomorrow, I'm not going to shortchange the public, being in a, a grumpy mood, well that might actually have helped things, but I didn't want to rush. So Hotchkiss leaves and I start working on website orders instead, because now the big fucking story here in Louisville on Thursday was they were calling for severe weather. Severe thunderstorms, possible tornadoes, high damaging winds, all these things coming through on Thursday night. And all that, they're breaking in on the WDRB Fox Network programming to show the weather radar. And it's coming, folks, and it's coming. So I'm sitting there all night waiting for 10 o'clock to come where the heavens are supposed to converge on us and just rain down biblical fury. And we start getting the reports. There's a tornado, and they had horrible weather in Alabama, right, and all the parts down south. And then we've there's a tornado down around Hodgenville, 50 miles to the south, and there's ping-pong ball-sized hail 40 miles to the north, and there's torrential rain 30 miles to the west, and the wind is blowing. Holy shit. Brian, I sat up till after midnight. It never even rained at my place. Not a drop. So then I'm a what the fuck? Now we've I've set up all night. All all night all the way till midnight. You know I'm a senior citizen. And didn't even get no severe weather. So the next day, Friday morning, I get up bright and early, go and visit Bree at the post office, ship about 125 packages that I'd prepared Thursday afternoon after the failed cameo shoot, came back home and shot all the cameos. And and thank you, everybody, once again, and I wish we could do some more soon, but as you'll soon find out, for at least a month, there will be no cameos for you. But here's also the thing is, now that we got the email situation straightened out, what we did was to avoid panic and chaos <laughs> like we had last time, even though we got more server. I had announced we were going to put the figures on sale on Friday. And since there were so many, I mean, an unlimited supply this time, like 1,500 of each, well, how in the world, how long will it take to sell all those? We'll just sneak them up at midnight on Friday, because technically that's Friday, and let people order them at their leisure. It's not like anybody's going to lose out. Some people were apparently smart to this strategy, Brian. 
because within 30 minutes, we'd already had a hundred orders at midnight. Um, and it, it continued all day on Friday. Um, and it is continued. We're recording this program, by the way, for the people who give a shit very early on, very early on Saturday morning. So it can be out on Saturday night on schedule. And as of this point, uh, we have been going back and forth on what to do about this, but we've received in the uh, less than 36 hours over a thousand individual orders with many people ordering the two pack of two figures or multiple figures or multiple items in addition to figures. And while it didn't blow our website up, I'm still only one human being. And also because the fact that Hotchkiss doesn't have the new website ready and the old website has been fried so many times. I think I've mentioned this before. I think the Midnight Express scrapbook, when we found a couple of boxes of those, that fried our inventory system. So I've got to go through manually and count everything that's been sold and determine that we're not overselling figures, which is going to take a while. So, um, what our plan is, if so many of you, and I'm taking so much time on this because so many of you now have money invested with me, and I take this responsibility seriously. Uh, by the time you hear this, or if not, probably sometime on Sunday, what we're going to do is we're going to like the, you know, well, you know this, Brian, it's a good analogy for you. The, the, the circuit breaker they've got on the Dow Jones. When trading just goes crazy uh, rapidly in either direction, they just suspend trading. We're going to suspend sales of everything until we can get a grip on how much we've sold and what we've got left, if anything, in the way of figures. And I may be able to get a few more from the toy company, but we've got to get a grip on this because also before the figures went on sale, is in the 10 days that we've been since we've reopened the store, I thought I had a month's worth of shirts and we had to order another 20 dozen in four days. And I thought I had enough Tuesday night at the gardens books and we had to order more of those within a week. And some people are going to be waiting on some of those things for a week or so. So if you have ordered before the figures went on sale, your stuff's going to go out first, eventually sometime in the next week. And if you've ordered a figure up until now, your stuff's going to go out within the next four weeks. <laughs> That's the, I figured out if I spend five minutes on each one of these packages, that it would be somewhere around 50 something hours, which you would have to spread over a couple of different days, along with that pesky habit of sleeping and eating, right? If you did nothing else, including taking my, my good 15 minute morning Russo. So be understanding folks, but, uh, I don't know exactly when we're going to suspend. It could be by the time you hear this tonight, it could be sometime on Sunday. We may make it till Monday morning, but when we hit a certain number of orders, we've got to pull it down, inventory everything, and then see if we've got anything left to put back on sale. Does that, does that sound reason? I'm doing, I'm only one man. I'm doing what I can. And you scoff at me because I insist on this personal service, this connection I have with the cult members. You think I ought to just farm it out to some robot in Lithuania somewhere. Uh, but Not exactly. Uh, but. but all I'm going to do for the next month, folks, is record the podcast, fill the orders, and of course, and take care of Stacy after her back surgery a week from Monday. So I'm going to need a hobby for my spare time. Um, I will not encourage you to... <laughs> to purchase anything from me but if 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 you want to if you have to and you go to the website now and see the store is still up do it quick of course the mothership shirts are still on sale at tinyurl.com slash superpod store i might as well throw that in there right here well there you go for all the people who get turned away from cornet's collectibles <laughs> hop on over <laughs> Hop on over there and get you a fine quality shirt and and uh, some mother sh mothership memorabilia. That's right. All right, we we've got a, a a potpourri of items to talk about that are going on in the professional wrestling world this week. Uh, and in, including them, more names have been announced. 
for the WWE Hall of Fame, the virtual ceremony this year, including last year's people. We've talked about this recently, but now there's more. Is this correct? There's more. Yeah, they're adding a lot fast and furiously right before the Hall of Fame. And, you know, we've talked in the past about what the WWE Hall of Fame is and what it signifies and how it may be one thing to experts and one thing to the audience, but it means something to the people being inducted. And we are, what, two weeks in front of WrestleMania, and now they're just announcing everyone as fast as they can. It's like a dump of names in the last week and a half. Well, and and I mean, we're not watching the programming closely, but are they doing for each of these individuals what they normally do when they when they draw the the uh, announcements out a bit more when they concentrate on one per show or one per week or whatever? Are they doing profile videos? Are they giving any context to? Are they just hey, and here he's going to come too? Well, when you say we're not watching the programs closely, what you mean is we're not watching the programs. So I have well, no I, idea. I, I didn't want to be rude. I didn't know if you'd heard. If you, You've usually got your ear to the ground. I think what they're doing is what they've done the last several years, which is kind of they take a name and they give it to one specific entity and let you break this name. And then we'll give this name to Sports Illustrated. We'll give this name to Rolling Stone. You break this name. They've broken quite a few names. <laughs> um, well, the one that caught my eye that's being inducted into the prestigious Hall of Fame this year, of course, and how could you deny this man's incredible technical skills, his verbal ability, his long history of drawing main event, big box office houses, incredible string of pay-per-view appearances, show stealer in every aspect of the game. The great Kali, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah. A am I correct in assuming that now, in addition to the quotas that they we already know that they've had over the past several years, where there has to be a person of color, a tag team, a deceased person, a, a female, uh, you know, their various uh, cubby holes, that now they're appealing strictly to the YouTube audience in India. I mean, you've heard this, right? That apparently the massive part of their YouTube views comes from India for whatever reason. I get, do they not have television or they don't have broadcast television? They don't, I don't know what they got going on in India, but they watch a lot of YouTube. What do you know about this? They do watch a lot of WWE. We believe that's one of the reasons why everyone from impact wrestling to WWE has made a concerted push into India. but. It's also a great place for bots <laughs> that you could potentially purchase to watch your videos. Uh, not that we've ever done that or ever would, but I've heard that in the past about other uh, wrestling entities. They got so. great bot stores over there. That's right. Well, what do you think about the great Kali's qualifications, Brian, for going into the Hall of Fame? I mean, a, a, an, an, a, an incredible awe-inspiring orator, the likes of which we haven't seen since Big Bad John, uh, the incredible smoothness and agility that he displayed in his many classic wrestling appearances. I mean, I could go on and on, and I already have. They couldn't find any other Indian guy. Well, Every time I had seen him, and it, I admit that it wasn't regularly, he could barely fucking walk. He's slow, dull-witted, plodding. He made goddamn uh, Giant Silva look like fucking Andre. He is a former world heavyweight champion. So is fucking David Arquette and Shitstain. And I think th at the rate we're going, they may be in the Hall of Fame in the next several <laughs> years. But I think, you know, the other interesting thing about Kali, and uh, I was thinking about it the other day, is Although I don't think he was found to be a responsible, I have to look this up while we're talking, but he's another wrestler in the Hall of Fame now that killed a guy. Oh, that's right. When they were training him out in California, he tried to powerbomb somebody and that didn't end well. All pro wrestling. It was Roland Alexander. Yeah. And the, uh, there was a lawsuit. Again, that's why I said, I don't think, I don't know if they sued him, but they sued APW, I believe at the time. And they were found to be responsible, that they were reckless. 
but I don't remember if he was actually sued, but it was him. No, in the well, ring and, with- and also, here's the thing. He was a student in the school. They, they found the, the, the school bore responsibility and having operated training programs, I know something about this. The school bore the responsibility because how can you find one student responsible for injuring another student when they're doing what a school and instructors are telling them to do that type of thing, I believe is what, what, but the point is, yes, he's just so fucking giant and massive. He didn't mean to fucking hurt the guy. He's just a big fucking klutz. But the point is what case are they making that this guy w- was any kind of legitimate hall of fame star, except the fact that we want a bunch of people in India to watch it on YouTube. How, what other case can you make? What great match can you point to? What great promo can you point to? What great box office uh, accomplishment can you point to? What, what can you point to? He was a star on their television show (laughs) and they got a kick out of him and they're inducting him. I will say this. It is a little weird inducting people this year. I'm assuming there's going to be no one there. I mean, part of the, the kick. I mean, you were at an uh, induction ceremony, although you weren't inducted. You gave a speech. Yeah. Part of the kick is that there are people there reacting. There are people there clapping and chanting and cheering. And it's kind of a, you know, even though some of these people appear on TV again, it's kind of a end of the road. It's kind of a a closing of the book. You're inducted into the Hall of Fame in front of the crowd, in front of your peers, and you get the reaction. It's a little different if it's just this kind of virtual Hall of Fame. I don't know how they're going to do this. Well, and that's the thing. And I, you know, some people say, well, you know, don't they get enough glory or whatever? It's not even the, it's making the speeches and the presentations and the overall entertainment value of the, the show more palatable when there are people there, especially fans and feedback. When you're just speaking into an empty room, you might as well be given a fucking financial, you know, symposium or something. It's going to be dry to some extent even possibly drier than empty arena wrestling matches because there's no, there's no, like you said, there's no feedback, no emotion there, but uh, I am but, looking I, forward know, to Kali's speech. No, I'm dying to see what this will be. Who's going to induct him. That's a good question. Who's going to induct him? Who was the next worst wrestler in the world? Who could say, <laughs> Hey, here's the guy that took the heat off of me. I was going to say you could have another giant do, but they just lost the big show. Oh, well, no, Vince wouldn't want them standing next to each other because one of them would be, ta- be taller and that would screw the whole thing up. Hey, real quick, if I can ask you a question real quick, slightly off topic, but I just got reminded of it mentioning the big show. So, of course, Paul White signs with AEW. And I believe I heard that he did an interview somewhere. Maybe it was on Jericho show. I'm not sure, but all the AEW guys are kind of pushed to do Jericho show. So I'm thinking it may be Jericho show where he said that when he signed, Vince called him up and just thanked him and wished him good luck and said that he'd be a great addition to their roster. What do you think that says, if anything, about what Vince thinks about him leaving for AEW? The fact that Vince called him up and congratulated him and said, I think you'll do great over there. Instead of, you know, when he called Jesse in, Ventura after the lawsuit, that's my money. You got well, yes. my money, you know. <laughs> and also, in, instead of offering Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson 750 grand a year apiece not to go to the company that's about to start up, now it's like show goes and he calls him up and congratulates him. Vince has now realized what I can see where there was trepidation when AEW was first announced and when the the process was in place for it to become a thing and nobody knew exactly what it was going to look like although i as history has shown i had a pretty good idea but nobody knew for sure and there's money and there's turner television and blah 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 and i can see where even if vince didn't take it all that seriously a lot of the people in decision making uh, positions in the company we're not around in de- in those decision making positions 20 years ago when they had the last fight with Turner Television um i i wouldn't be surprised if as many of the non wrestling side executives in WWE as maybe people in the wrestling production end of it were 
trepidatious or wondering what this was going to be like and it was going to be a good idea to head things off the pass and not let anybody go there and keep a talent, you know, freeze them out of talent. So they'll have to get these fucking off-brand indie outlaw guys. And wouldn't you know who won the pony? Uh, once that they have now seen for a year and a half, this is what AEW is and is going to be, and it ain't going to change, and they don't know how to change it. I think now they realize, okay, this is actually good because th there's no competition. We don't have nothing to worry about in a major scheme of things. This show is what it's going to be, and it's going to attract the audience it's going to attract. And if guys that like Big Show that we wanted to retire or move into legends positions or just wanted to have hanging around to do the publicity appearances and et cetera that are the end of their career can go and get more of this fucking guy's money, then obviously also Vince McMahon wants Tony Khan to spend as much money on guys that are not actually on the wrestling roster, at least in a full-time way, as possible. He wants him to spend money on staying, and staying only wrestles in a cinematic match or something every so often and otherwise just comes out and shakes his bat on TV. He wants Big Show to go become an announcer and take more of this guy's money and only wrestle sparingly because he knows that they can't... They had Shaquille O'Neal, for fuck's sake, and on free TV and just cracked a million viewers. So they, he knows that they can't make mega money on pay-per-view to his standards with Big Show, but the Big Show can make money. So basically Vince knows they're not a threat. He doesn't want them signing up his current talent on television. He's learned that lesson from the last time around against Turner Television, and he's got all the current guys that he wants under contract. But for these names that get snatched up by Tony Khan, at this point, he's probably happy. He lets them go. They make more money than he wanted to pay them or that they were worth to him. He congratulates them for getting that job, and they remember that. And whenever the inevitable happens and the fucking next challenger to the WWE, AEW, goes a fucking way, then he brings those guys back and inducts them in the Hall of Fame. And they're happy to come because they remember that he congratulated them for taking more money than he was going to give them. Do you see how this works? Yeah. Yeah, I do. And that's how that works. But in the meantime, Back to the Hall of Fame. Uh, other names have been announced. They have? I guess that was you wanting me to pitch some names at you. I was, I was, who do you want to talk about next? I was, it was, it was called, a, I'm trying to have some verbal intercourse with you and you're not wanting to have intercourse with me. No means no. <laughs> but I'll throw another name at you. Someone who, in a lot of ways, I guess you could say you gave his big break to. Although he had done a few things in Puerto Rico and in Memphis, but Glenn Jacobs, the mayor of Knox County, Kane, Dr. Isaac Yankum, hey. Diesel 2, <laughs> I don't know what we call that character exactly, or just Diesel, I guess. <laughs> but what do you think about Kane going into the Hall of Fame? And, and obviously, now we're back to reality because this is one of the ticket sellers. They, they always want main event guys and, and stars. Kane is... What, at this point, he's the longest-running roster member, right? Continuous WWE roster guy since 1990, was it six? No, actually, Isaac Yankin was five because he left before we closed Smoky Mountain. So, since 1995, and he's made seven figures a year on more than one occasion. Uh, he's... You know, one of the standout names of the Attitude Era, when pay-per-views were doing huge business, when houses were doing big business, when the ratings were big, um, more people would see Kane in the course of a week on one television program than, than see all the TV programs on a national basis put together every week this week, you know, this year or in these times. So... I mean, you know, Glenn, he's been a model employee. His politics are a little screwy, uh, but he's been a model employee. He never did anything outside the ring to 
embarrass himself or the company. Uh, his matches were well thought of. Obviously, the promo thing uh, was was it, until he you know found the vocal cord transplant or however they explained that he's been mute for <laughs> fucking four years and suddenly he can talk again. I don't know, but the point is he was a burn victim. Well, and then they got the you know the artificial <laughs> voice box, and then the they put a skull face, you know the, the they skinned the skull and put a new face on for him. Anyway, um, yeah, except for his politics, I can't and have never been able to say anything bad about Glenn. And even then, he's not a fucking irrational QAnon. We want to storm the Capitol lunatic. He's just closer to a Republican as a libertarian than he is to a Democrat. But there, that's a main event, Hall of Fame, especially a WWE Hall of Fame. Because when you think about it, Kane never, Kane never wrestled for any other wrestling promotion in the United States of America besides Memphis Wrestling, Smoky Mountain Wrestling, and the WWE. Well, he did right? a job. He did a job in WCW. I saw, I think, a clip of him. No, and I'm Sting. saying Kane. Oh, Kane as a Kane. gimmick. Okay, yes. And actually, well, then, it, it, yes, he did uh, jobs a couple times when he'd been in the business like two months on a couple of WCW tapings. He's 6'10", they have him as a job guy. Yeah, well, well, show. look at the look at the time period. And then he pretty much went to Puerto Rico, so you can make the case that still, Glenn Jacobs, besides two job appearances, for, he was like Big Bubba. Um, two job appearances for WCW and then Memphis, Smoky Mountain, Puerto Rico, if you count that as the continental United States and uh, WWE in a 26, seven year career. You know, when you and brought him in consistent, when you brought him in with a name that hasn't aged very well, Unabom. <laughs> Why? Why is it now? Is there a is there a lobby to prevent people from maligning Unabombers? Well, I think we want to uh, not do anything to, in any way, celebrate domestic terrorists. <laughs> but it kind of ended up all right for him because even though a lot of fans sit back and say, "Oh, I really wish I could have seen what Eddie Gilbert would have done in Smoky Mountain," him and Al Snow was the better combination. Yeah, it made more sense. I've said it before, whatever anyone wants to say about Al Snow, I thought he was one of the best heels in the entire business in 95 in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And then he never was that guy ever again. Yeah. Because he went, you know, he did head in ECW, became Avatar in WWE, became a new rocker. But as just a heel Al Snow, he was great in Smoky Mountain with Unabom. And I don't know if it would have been that great with Unabom and Eddie Gilbert as a unit. But what do you think? Well... Eddie was Eddie was smarter to the business at that time. Eddie was more experienced on the sea. Al had been wrestling since 1982, and this was 1995, but he had never done television, except for when he was a rookie, he did the Pafos show as a job guy. Eddie obviously had been all over all kinds of television and had tons of experience and was smart to the business, but I, I don't know if they would have had the chemistry personally. And I think that Eddie would have probably taken more of the spotlight just because he was that oversized personality. Not like he's going to be shitting on Glenn, but Al, Al was hungry and brand new and fresh and different. And, and I've joked that the, you know, the first couple of TVs, since he'd never done it, his promos were the shits. He didn't, he wasn't comfortable and he didn't even want to talk. Right. But then after two or three weeks and, and I talked to him a couple of times, I'm like, you know, eh. all of a sudden, then he started talking. He got it. It turned on quickly. He started talking and you couldn't shut him up. And then his interviews would always go over. I started having to add extra time on the formats for Al Snow to talk, but it was good. So he just, you know, but he was, Al was really wanting to do something and he never had the chance to do it up until that point. Whereas, Eddie, you know, it was Knoxville at that point was kind of a, a step down after he'd been in WCW and, you know, the things that he wanted to do. And, you know, so I don't think he was that hungry and just that that was going to put that much oomph in it. He would have been good, but I think Al and Glenn had better chemistry and they were just they were hungry and ready to do something. If Eddie had stayed, do you think you eventually you would have had a problem because he. 
I mean, at this point in his career, he only wanted the book. He didn't yeah. want to just be a talent on a show. He wanted to be a booker. Well, see, that's why I told him, because also, remember, I'd been doing it 92, 93, 94, three solid years. I said, Eddie, um, we can talk, you and I, about your stuff, and then you take it and run with it. Just make sure I know what you're doing. If you've got any other ideas, I'm more than welcome to hear them. If he had come in and done a Buddy Landell the second run where he was showing up on time, he was clean, he was wearing suits and responsible, I could have seen letting Eddie book Smoky Mountain Wrestling. But in the, he showed up the once <laughs> and did the TV and then never came back and went to Puerto Rico. and To book. To book. But, you know, it didn't work out well. I... W I don't know at that time. I don't know that the, the money could have been much different that, I mean, obviously they were paying him more money in Puerto Rico than I was going to be paying him in, in Smoky mountain, but he would have had to have worked three or four days a week in the other end of the state that he lived in rather than going to Puerto Rico and the living conditions that prevailed down there for the boys at that time and et cetera, to make another three or $400 a week. And it, it, you know, it would have been better if he'd have stayed obviously because he wouldn't have been close to the Puerto Rican pharmacies. Um, but it also, I don't know, maybe it was, maybe he wanted to get away from, you know, the continental United States, I have no idea, but all in all, I guess he just wanted to be the booker somewhere. Back to Kane, when Isaac Yankum happens, and he had a good match with Brett, but the gimmick was death. Yeah, yeah. And then the new Diesel, otherwise known as Diesel, because <laughs> they pretended it was really Diesel. <laughs> did you think something like Kane would happen, or did at any point you think... This guy has size, he's smart, he can go in the ring for a guy that size, he's just not going to get a chance. At any point, you think he wouldn't get his chance because oh, of the yeah. way he well, used? Yeah, I was led to believe he wasn't going to get a chance when Vince said, well, we're probably going to have to let that boy go. <laughs> That's, that was a good indication <laughs> um, that he went, no, Vince, I he never admitted it, but he went to the dentist one day and had an idea. And that's because he had, they had already, I already knew he was interested in Glenn because Taker had come down to Smoky Mountain and, and worked with him. And, you know, I'd put in a word for him because, you, you know, you could see that's where he needed to be. Glenn was tailor-made for guys like Taker and Big Show and Mark Henry, whole nine yards, the Giants, land of the Giants. Um... And he, I knew he could make a ton of money up there. But when Vince called me, and I've mentioned this, he called me so giddy. I, I can't wait to send you the videos we've done of Glenn. He's Isaac Yankum, Dr. I Yankum. He's a dentist, and he's got the jaws teeth, the, the rotten teeth. And oh, my God. And I'm trying to, on the other end of the phone, go, oh, that's, that's, that's lovely. And, you know, it, it, they even gave Vince liked it so much. That's why he put him with Lawler, because he wanted Lawler to talk it over. Get it over by talking, right? And it just it was just a rotten gimmick that wasn't going to end. And Glenn didn't feel comfortable. And nobody, that was another joke profession. So then I thought, but but they still had faith in him. It was never his work or performance or attitude or, you know, him. That was the problem. So then I've mentioned this story before also, so I'll gloss over it real quickly, but I was still on the creative team with fake razor and diesel. And we had had a meeting at Vince's house to discuss the television that was coming up. That was going to be shot the following Monday and Tuesday. And then I go on the road on Saturday, Friday and Saturday or whatever it was to manage Vader and I walk in the building in Tulsa, and all the boys are asking me, hey, we hear Razor and Diesel are coming back? This is like Saturday, and I'd just been at a creative meeting on Thursday. I'm like, what are you fucking talking about? We heard it on Livewire, whatever the Saturday morning show was at that point, that they said, ah, they're coming back. They're going to be on Raw on Monday. I'm like, what? And that's when I called Bruce 
who was still in Connecticut. I said, why is everybody saying that Razor and Diesel are coming back? Well, uh, Vince had an idea, and uh, we own the characters. I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <sighs> so... <laughs> So that's the way sometimes the creative team members would find if you, if you weren't in town for a day or if you slept overnight, cause Vince never does, you'd find out that these new stars were debuting on the show. You thought you'd just written anyway. And that was fucking abysmal. And that's when, and at, at, at a meeting one time, Vince didn't believe that Glenn had what he called the killer instinct. He did not vicious enough. He just, and he was overlooking the fact that he Glenn was self-conscious and not comfortable going out there either doing a dumb gimmick or going out there and pretending to be somebody else and getting hooted at by the fans. And that's why he couldn't show his true self. And and he made the statement, well, you know, if, if he can't find the killer instinct, I'm afraid we're going to have to let him go. He's a great prospect. And then, and we've mentioned this before, I... I, I can't say that Bruce Pritchard was the one that had the idea for the Undertaker's evil brother specifically. Um, he called him Kane because they'd been playing with that name for the Undertaker, and Bruce was always closely involved in what Taker did. Uh, so I can't say the concept of a brother, but then the concept of the brother Kane as it as he came up you know, was, was discussed by Bruce. And, and then I had the idea, as I've mentioned, it's, he sounds like Michael Myers to me. Why don't we do videos of, you know, because to introduce the vignettes that uh, they used to do to introduce people from Kane's point of view, he's behind and I'm still going back to the Glenn wore the hockey mask like humongous when he was Unabomb. Uh, Michael Myers has got the William Shatner mask in Halloween. You could see the point of view shot in Halloween through, from Michael Myers's eyes through the mask. What if we just saw through this mask of some kind and with the muffled breathing and through the eye holes, you, you're in a room that is completely covered, floor to ceiling, wall to wall, with pictures of The Undertaker, a la the Omen movies where the, the priest is trying to protect himself. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm researching from entertainment, right? I saw him as a fucking, you know, somewhat of a mentally demented serial killer with potential supernatural powers that you didn't he was human but you didn't quite understand how he could do the things he did a la michael myers and of course when we got the costumes from creative services the drawings for the cane outfit because he'd been burned up in a fire he looked more like a fucking fantastic four costume for the human torch so the 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 uh, low key aspect of him was thrown out the window, but then once we introduced him, <laughs> yeah. naturally, if you've been burned to a crisp, yeah, you want your outfit to show leotards. flames. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're wearing the red leotards, but um, but then since I knew Glenn and worked with him a bunch and knew what he could do, and I'm the one who taught him how to work like Kevin Nash, that took 15 minutes. Um, they gave me a lot of Kane's early matches and I, you know, I've said, I pitched the pulling the door off the hell in a cell based on Doug Furness and what Kevin Sullivan did with him in Knoxville and all those stories. But for a lot of the initial several months of, of Kane, I was his producer so that we could come up with ways to try to, I never wanted him to actually do supernatural things if I was, it was never my idea. He or the Undertaker, either one, would throw lightning from their hands. The idea that, is that he's a human, but he's a giant human. He's a fucking mentally fucked up human behind that mask. And maybe he's got some kind of supernatural tolerance to pain or ability to withstand things. And maybe he can do some spooky things where you wonder, well, how'd he do that? But you don't just come out and. and, and they went, as usual, everybody went haywire with the supernatural aspects 
during and immediately afterwards the after the attitude era and it got a little gaga but i thought the the original much like the original version of most classic comic book characters and their origin story is more simple and believable and then it gets crazier as you go i like the guy that what always scared me about horror movies was not the the giant space creatures that you're like, okay, this ain't good. It was the fucking spooky, possibly real, mentally fucked up, halfway supernatural serial killer that you could believe and buy. That shit's scary. I'm I'm not too scared of the goddamn invisible man. Well, Jim, another name going into the Hall of Fame purportedly will be Rob Van Dam. And you say, purportedly, we have no confirmation on this? Well, I've seen different reports that he was, but again, you see it from different sources. If WWE has released an official statement saying it, I just haven't seen it. It Maybe they're just waiting. To, they, they, they put it out there, but they don't want to advertise it too strongly just in case he gets high and forgets to go. <laughs> I don't, no, <laughs> and, and once again, that, that's that's a fine choice. RVD for especially for a WWE Hall of Fame, really the only. I mean, he worked in WCW early in his career, but not in a prominent position. Um, he was Robbie V, and the yes. reason I remember that was one of the New York free hotlines in the nineties. There were good ones, there were bad ones. Dominic Valente is still doing it, which is amazing. Wow. But one of them had this kid who just, he clearly had no knowledge of wrestling from a few years earlier, because he was just reading like a list of like names that guys formerly used, and he said, Rob Van Dam, or as he was known in WCW, Robbie Five. <laughs> but it was Robbie V. It was Robbie V. He was the one that came after Robbie's one, two, three, and four. <laughs> That's right. In that in that angle. Um. Yeah, but point is, he's primarily known as an ECW guy or a WWE guy, and, you know, he fits perfect. I mean, we've, I don't even think that RVD would be one to say that he belongs in the pantheon of immortals next to Jim Londos, Luthez, Gorgeous George, Ric Flair, Steve Austin, whatever, but he's more than Hall of Fame level, especially in in the company that he spent much of his time in so that's not, i mean they don't usually pick outlandish picks in the single male categories except for the subgenres that they have to fill some of the you know some of the women and some of the celebrity inductees may be borderline sometimes all the celebrity inductees are borderline but you know, except for when they have to fill a quota like Kali with the YouTube audience, you know, there's nothing wrong with Kane or RVD. And they join who uh, the NWO, as we mentioned before, and and also uh, Bischoff. Davy Boy. Davy Boy from last year. You know, yeah, th those are not outlandish choices. Do you think they should have just waited to do another class? I mean, they already announced the people from last year. And again, it's a shame if the NWO and Bischoff are going in in front of no audience there because it kind of, in some ways, defeats the purpose. But do you think they should have waited as opposed to doing two classes this year? Just done last year's class this year and then push it back a year? I don't see why they didn't. Yeah, I don't understand why they're... Because now they've, they've used up a bunch, and they're using up twice as many people in an empty building. So, yeah. I, I, you know, but I'm sure that was well thought out. And and many people were consulted before <laughs> Vince made that decision when he woke up one morning. Now, God damn it, we're not going to skip it. We're going to do it anyway. You know, RVD is one of the last big WWE stars because he, he got over better than they pushed him because they regularly didn't want him to get over to the level that he <laughs> did. But he's one of the last guys that had his own unique style that didn't have the cookie-cutter WWE style in the ring. He did unique things in his own way, and there aren't too many people. I mean, you watch WWE now, and everyone, even guys who were stars on the indies, they kind of get brought into that WWE way of working. RVD stood out. He was still unique. Well, 
And there's a reason for that because he could do it athletically. He could do that shit and not kill himself or some, most of the time, anybody else. Um, so they, when you, I've, I've said this before, RVD was kind of a modern day Argentina Rocca in that his basics for the business were complete shits, but because athletically he could do these freakish things for the time, everything changes, but he could do these freakish things and not kill himself. And it, it, it was different. And, and especially a guy that size doing it with a good physique and et cetera. So he, it, that's what gets over with people. But then when people who don't have that special athletic aptitude try to do the shit, then it comes off like a fucking goof with bad basics. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah. You, you see, you see the, you see the flaws that you don't see whether it's Ray Mysterio, his unique ability to overcome in people's consciousness and their, their eyes, the, his size, or whether it's RVD with just the weird things that he could do without blowing his fucking knees out and all that other shit. Guys can do things that you shouldn't do and get away with it because they have a unique athletic ability to do that thing. And it still doesn't just glare at you that it, God, this is rotten. But other people who try to emulate them when people try to have the garbage matches that Mick Foley used to have, but they can't work. They can just hit each other with shit. It, it doesn't work. And so those are the people that you need to stay away from. There are people in the music business, right? That they, that everybody says, don't ever cover so-and-so because you'll just fall on your face as a singer. Well, don't ever try to emulate certain people in wrestling with the way they do things that are unorthodox because there's a reason why they're the only ones that are getting over doing that and everybody else looks like a klutz. Did you ever talk to him about Smoky Mountain? Because he wasn't yet in ECW. I don't know how if he was even on your radar. He was doing some all Japan stuff. No. And I mean that's and that's not an insult to Rob Van Dam, but I I didn't his his style would have completely not worked in Knoxville. And he he didn't I can you imagine Rob Van Dam having a match with any of my well, with, he was a heel back then, primarily, with any of my baby faces. Can you imagine Rob Van Dam versus Ricky Morton? Rob Van Dam no. versus Tracy Smothers. I'm sure they had that in ECW at one point, but not with Tracy featured as the guy. Um, complete style differences. He was perfect for ECW. Same thing with, with, uh, with Raven, Scotty. There were some guys that were perfect for ECW and wouldn't have nobody would give a shit in Knoxville or vice versa. Perfect in Knoxville and nobody would give a shit about him in Philadelphia. And that's why you when you're booking a promotion and assembling a talent roster, you you not only decide what style of wrestling and what logic in your wrestling universe that you want to present, but you also have to look at if you're going for a territory it's not so much important on a national basis, but if you're going for a territory, who does the style of wrestling that traditionally sells in this territory? If they don't do it, they may be fine wrestling talent for another promotion, but they don't fit my fucking casting call. And, and that's another thing that's a lost art these days. A lot of people think that you just do the same thing in fucking Des Moines as you do in fucking Dayton. And it don't work. All right. Well, that's so far is what we know about this year's WWE Hall of Fame class of 2020 and 2021. The Hall of Fame train is on the tracks. Is it? And speaking of trains. <laughs> you bastard. You sent me the clip. Of our friend Braun Strowman. I'm going to join with Shane McMahon. This guy has to be just a stupid son of a bitch. He really does. If I was a serious top main event star and competitor and some wise-ass editor on the, on the production team 
decided to drop in train choo-choo noises when I was doing my big <laughs> run around the ring and shoulder tackle somebody spot on television, I would go and, and grab them by the neck and squeeze their britches full. But apparently, Jesus Christ, I thought it was a rib. I thought that was was had been added in by some wise ass on the internet, but that's the way they aired that segment of his match was it not that was the way it aired on raw allegedly and i say that because we, i didn't watch because it's raw but as soon as it aired immediately like seconds later the tweets started coming in oh my god you have to show jim Cornette this and i'm thinking what could it be and i started seeing choo-choo noises train noises sound effects and i'm like you know i'm thinking like, in what context i mean his gimmick isn't the train conductor <laughs> You know, like, how did this work? And then I saw it and I said, well, wait a minute. See, oh here's, it's very close because <laughs> train conductors say all aboard and people watching Braun Strowman matches say all are bored. <laughs> but for the people who were lucky enough not to have witnessed this travesty. So Braun Strowman's wrestling Elias and, and the other guy that's with him is on the outside. And this is at the behest of Shane McMahon, who's still milking that bad knee. So he doesn't get beat up by Braun Strowman. And Strowman does the deal where he knocks the guys to the floor and he rolls out underneath the ropes and gets a head of steam up. He starts moving a little bit and he runs around the ring and gives the big shoulder tackle. Right. And, and it's like a train running over you. And when he start, he holds his hand up in the air and starts his little running in place thing to get get his some some momentum built up, and he goes, wah, 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 wah. and in an empty building, and uh, sound effects. Now I I expect to see like on Batman, pow, splat, bam on the screen, and here's the thing. Have you ever seen a shittier looking shoulder tackle in your life than what he gives these guys? They're taking bumps, flying over railings, flying through tables, act like they've been hit by a goddamn 18 wheeler. And he's barely touching them. In the first one, the guy that went over the desk, you saw he got his hands up and just pushed him over the desk. <laughs> and then he runs around. Droo, 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 droo. <laughs> he runs around to the other guy and he barely grazes him with his shoulder. And the guy goes down like he's been hit by the fucking barge that's stuck in the Suez Canal. Has anybody bothered to tell him, hey, here's how you do a shoulder tackle, pal? Or are they are they seeing something I'm missing? Can You, you can see daylight coming through there. And now that it and it doesn't look like a train, it looks like goddamn Fisher Price fucking choo choo toy. Now with sound effects. <laughs> now with sound effects, that's right. That was ridiculous. <sighs> Who does that appeal to? That's the other thing. If the argument is, oh well, this is for kids, I would get it. However, based on the demos we see, kids aren't really watching. I mean, that isn't the audience for Raw. It's older people. Who is this for? What is the target audience for train noises? And do you also think this speaks towards the importance of high-speed rail in this country? I do. I, As a matter of fact, I think that immediately high-speed rail should be put in place so anytime Braun Strowman wrestles, I can get on one of them things, get as far away as possible in a shortest period of time. And it... <sighs> but... And, and then, of course, then, then Shane ran away. And, and they missed a golden opportunity because, of course, once that Strowman's got the guys down and he's after Shane, Shane has to throw the... Uh, Shane hits him with the crutch and he doesn't sell it. And Shane has to run away on the bad knee. They missed a golden opportunity if Shane had got to the stage and turned around and Strowman had called attention to it and then Shane had looked down and realized, oh, shit, I was running. But he just acted like, well, everybody knew it was I was fucking ribbing anyway. I, d I don't. I don't know. I don't understand the whole thing, but now we've got sound effects. Do you think it, 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 what you mentioned also about are, are they children? The audience 
is not children, but they just act like it. A WWE is adults performing wrestling for apparent children, and AEW is children performing wrestling for apparent adults. The, the WWE fans are watching WWE because they actually kind of liked wrestling, and that's what they've, they've got used to, and they want it to make sense. And over on the other channel, they're watching wrestling that they don't want to make sense. So I don't know who the adults in this room are. But at least if Braun Strowman is on Raw, at least as a palate cleanser, we now have the gorgeous, the talented, that magnificent beast herself. Rhea Ripley is on Raw. Raw is Rhea. I hear, I hear bed springs in the background on your side. My chair is getting a little squeaky over here on this side. Your chair is getting squeaky as soon as you start thinking about Rhea Ripley? As, well, as soon as you mentioned Rhea Ripley, I just so happened to shift in my chair. You just happened to shift in your chair and it went squeak, 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 squeak. Hey, Rhea Ripley makes us all make sound effects. Um, <laughs> She looks fantastic. What a fucking gimmick. She... She's a star. She's a celebrity. She's a personality. She has charisma. She has magnetism. She said for the, she has confidence when she comes out, gets up on the ring, does her entrance. She comes in the, she speaks well. She had inflection in her voice. She had facial expression. Everything you would want from debuting a star. And I guarantee you that Vince saw her and said, where have we been hiding her at? And he, he, she's tailor made to be the face or one of the faces of that women's division. Um, I, I hope Charlotte is. They say Charlotte now may be sketchy for WrestleMania because of the COVID, right? I hope she's okay. Yeah, I'm assuming she's out of WrestleMania because it was going to be her versus Oscar. I think. Okay, well then, in that case, in that solves that i don't know if they're trying to pull a three-way or whatever i heard that charlotte had quarantined and was hoping to be ready but that was several days ago whatever the point is you've she's different rhea ripley is different and marketable and stands to me height wise nevertheless i'm talking about in terms of charisma and potential head and shoulders above most of the female roster that they have currently but i enjoyed that entrance i enjoyed that promo i enjoyed that challenge and then guess who had to answer the challenge oscar oscar she's great don't even start oh now i am gonna blister you here and you're gonna and you're gonna explain to me okay you're gonna explain to me why that this uh, this Oscar gimmick is not the most offensive racist thing that you, that has ever been perpetrated on American television. What the fuck? She she talks like one of the Japanese soldiers that used to pop up on Gilligan's Island. Oh, she makes faces and noises <laughs> like she's been impacted and constipated for weeks and is trying to pass a goddamn bowel movement the size of a canned ham. She makes goofy faces and hops around like she's a child and like she's illiterate or, and, and this is not, and I'm not saying that every single female Japanese wrestler in the business does that, but more of them do than don't, which is why that I fucking tuned down, tuned out and turned off. To the bunch of them. Explain to me why she has to act like that and talk like that. For the same reason that everyone in WWE acts and talks the way they do. Vince McMahon's philosophy is take adults and dumb them down to a degree that a child would be able to watch and possibly 
figure out what's going on. Now, again, the audience wait, wait, isn't what, that what child, child. What child speaks gibberish Japanese that sounds like Hans Conried in a fucking 60s TV program? Now, she didn't behave like this in NXT, but she got the Vince McMahon, and Vince at some point wanted her to dumb it down and just be a really dumb version of herself, and that's what you get. So it's Vince McMahon's fault that this girl is acting like a gibberish speaking uh, a mental midget. It, yes. It, and it's yes. because of Vince in the WWE. Explain Maki Ito. No, she's not even in WWE. That's what I'm saying. Maki Ito. I will try to explain this because I must admit after that spectacular segment on AEW, I became intrigued by this Maki Ito. Maki Ito's gimmick which apparently crosses over to real life in some fashion, was she was booted off, if it's not their version of Pop Idol, it was a Pop Idol slash American Idol kind of show in Japan, she was booted off for being a wrestler. So now her gimmick is, she's, what do they call her, the fired idol, the failed idol, I forget what they call her. But she comes out there and she still wants to perform her songs. Now in the ring, Maki Ito is no Asuka. Asuka can go in the ring. Asuka can go in the ring. Asuka versus Rhea Ripley will be great. I guarantee you right now. We can make a bet. I'll bet you that match will be great. And it won't just be because of Rhea Ripley. It'll be because it's two really good, talented wrestlers. Maki Ito, you could put her in there with prime Ric Flair. And I don't know if he'd be able to do anything. She's really, really, really not good. It's all about the stupid, silly performance. The point that I was making is, is that it's a multiple company thing that all these Japanese girls, not all, but the majority of, and I defy somebody to prove me wrong on this, act, look, or dress like complete fucking morons. Can you say that that statement that I made is, is drastically an error? I don't think it's accurate. Does does Io Shirai act or dress like a moron? I said not everybody. I said the majority. Okay, well, that's one. Hikaru Shida. There's two. How many? I mean, there aren't. Okay, I mean, give, me, give, me two, Sakura, give me two more. Emmy Sakura doesn't count because she hasn't been in the States in over give a year. Give me two now. more Japanese girls that have been seen on either program that besides the two you just mentioned that don't act, dress, or talk or work in a stupid fashion. Riho. Which, what did I just, you just, she, I just she doesn't up. act like a child. She dresses like a child. She, acts like, a on her a lo- she <laughs> acts like a lost ball in high weeds and the look on her face screams, find me. She can't work. She's a fucking, there's no personal charisma there. Whatever. She's like a downtrodden child at street urchin. With that, with that pained, hurt look on her face most of the time. Okay, well, that's five. That's five right there. There really aren't too many other regular Japanese wrestlers currently, female wrestlers currently working on American TV. So, sure, just just Olivier's crew. But they're not regular. I mean, Maki Ito's gone already. The other one... Oh, don't tease me. The other one, Rio, whatever, Maksanaga, whatever her name, I don't even know what her name was. It was Rio de Janeiro. Now, she sucked, too, the, the but street, she's... The street mime. I think she's back in Japan. I don't think she was going to, like, move to the States and be a regular in AEW. So, in terms of regulars, domestically, it's Io Shirai, it's Asuka, it's Hikaru Shida, yeah. it's Riho... There was yeah. another name. Uh, Maki Ito's already gone, so she doesn't count. Yeah. And then Carrie Sane, she's been gone for a while, so she doesn't count, although I could see you thinking she's more of the... Oh, Oscar. she was in a... See, you can't do that. That's... It's... That's what she was doing. I mean, she was saying actual words. It's just she's saying it in a... She's saying it in the fucking phony... Funny kind of 60s TV that they would overdub gibberish Japanese in on in a a comedy program. That's what Vince likes. But let's go back to Rhea Ripley, which is what we were talking about. (laughs) Rhea Ripley, ah. By the way, you want to talk about what Vince likes. The goddess. I agree. Rhea Ripley is beautiful. Okay, let me ask you a question. You're, You're shooting a major 
motion picture in Hollywood. Who are you going to hire, Oscar or Rhea Ripley? What's the picture? Any picture. No, not any picture. If it's Godzilla, I may go with Oscar. Oh, God. Now that's racist. I don't... Look, Rhea Ripley is a star. I think Oscar's great, too, and I think you have to... I think I'm... When you watch the match at WrestleMania, we'll see what you think, if you can objectively see it. Uh, but I will say this. We've seen a lot of Rhea Ripley the last, geez, I don't know, a year and a half, two years almost. We're both really high on her. There were periods where she disappeared off TV. She gets on Raw. Vince must have gotten a look at her and said, my God, she's beautiful. Why is she hiding her body? Because I could be wrong, but that was the most revealing thing she ever wore on wrestling. Am I wrong? I mean, you've seen a lot of her, too. Not as much as I've wanted to. Oh, come on. Uh, but I can't say that. Quite... You can't say that either. What? No, I mean, I want to see more of her matches. Okay. What do you... What, get your mind out of the gutter. You put it in the gutter. What? Well, well, and that's where it belongs. <laughs> um, but anyway, no, I'm sure he did. And, you know, uh, well, you know what the girls used to call them in the old days? The tickets. The, the May Youngs, the Moolahs, the, 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 even the Sherry's, folks of that generation, they don't cover up the tickets. You're selling the tickets. Interesting. Hello? <laughs> I, I think they're allowed to say that because they're women. But if, if you say that, there's a problem. But well, that's why I'm if, saying If Moolah that says it, it's said. okay. I, I am quoting. Yes. They didn't like to cover up the tickets. Anyway, speaking of censorship. Apparently, our friends at Peacock are now going to have their grubby fingers all over the WWE network before we get to look at everything that that uh, they have to offer there. Is this what I'm hearing? Yeah, this is something that wrestling fans first started noticing sometime in the last week. And then there have now been several articles in high-profile publications, the New York Daily News, the New York Post. I have one here from The Hollywood Reporter. The headline. Racist WWE moments are being removed as classic matches move to Peacock. And as 17,000 hours of wrestling programming transition from WWE Network to Peacock, fans have noticed that some scenes are missing. And the first two notable scenes are Roddy Piper at WrestleMania 6 against Bad News Brown in Toronto painted half his body black. And it was certainly a bad decision. <laughs> and I don't understand what the point of it was. Roddy has said, you know, it was the era of true colors. And this, but true colors came out several years before that. So that argument didn't really work either. <laughs> bad News Brown wasn't very happy about it. I remember seeing an interview with him, uh, Bad News <laughs> Allen, years ago. So they removed that. And also the other one is one of those ones that people always point at and go, what was this? Was Vince using the N word? in whatever 2006 or so backstage i think to booker t of all people no 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 what it was was he said it to john cena and booker, and t, booker t was standing was there one of those deals where he was standing around and overheard it so he said did he just say that and again i think this raises several issues one of which is it seems like the move the peacock's being rushed because they don't even have the functionality at the wwe yeah. network of having uh, specific moments indexed or the ability to scrub the, uh, you know, go from one thing to another easily or pause or whatever it is, they're not ready yet. It's being rushed because of WrestleMania. But the other thing is this idea of mass censorship of moments that, as of now, it's only being talked about for what are being called racist moments in wrestling history. And it raises a lot of questions about what could or may be edited. Will every time Jesse Ventura called Tito Santana Chico be edited? <laughs> will, I mean, just there's so many, will Saba Simba be edited just based on what the gimmick was? I mean, there's so many different things, so many things that have been said. The business used to be a different business, and I'm not justifying it, but there are a lot of promos by a lot of guys that were somewhat racially tinged. Oh, I mean, 1990 half, WCW. Half mine may disappear just for innuendo and, and uh, et cetera. 1990 WCW, Flair and JYD with Rocky King. I guess all that would be gone, but the issue becomes about censorship. You know, the Muppets just went up on Disney Plus, a moment that sexy geeks like myself really look forward to, and they put a disclaimer up for the Muppet Show. 
for the what? What's the disclaimer for the Muppets? Saying there may be some moments that are slightly insensitive, what? but they're but they're leaving them up, you know, because it's it's historical context. There for the was, Muppets for the Muppet Show, which, by the way, Harry Belafonte appeared on because he felt the Muppets were a unifying force, and it was a wonderful thing to show the people of the world that these Muppets could all get along the way white, black. And everyone could get along. Yeah, why can't you Muppets get along like these Muppets get along? And we saw oh. a couple of years ago, Gone with the Wind, there was an issue with that with HBO. And I think the question is, do you just whitewash things and censor things out of shows? Or do you leave it there so that it can be discussed and learned from? And you, well, you could have a disclaimer there to say there's a moment during this WrestleMania show where Roddy Piper painted himself half black. Uh... <laughs> And, and again, you it's something that, that might be a challenging graphic to write. You, you understand. I'm just I'm not saying that'll be the verbiage they would use there. But <laughs> I think that that's the issue. If it's just people who know nothing about wrestling and most of the people in WWE don't know anything about wrestling. But if it's peacock people, peacock people, that's the yeah. going yeah. in there. The, or as Dave Shearer calls them, the cock. If they're going in there and reviewing this footage and just deciding on their own what makes it or doesn't make it, that's troubling for wrestling history in its video form. From Mid-South Wrestling to Crockett Promotions to WWE, whatever's been on the network, if all of a sudden everything from 30 years ago is being edited for the sensibilities of today, that is troublesome. Well, it... <laughs> Nobody is going to miss the promo where Vince used the N-word to Cena. That was just a throwaway thing. Shouldn't have been done anyway, because Vince obviously thought it would be funny. Even When you start taking matches out of WrestleMania, even though, even though nobody knows why that Roddy decided that it would be a good idea to paint himself half black and... And he was the baby face, but I'm sure in his mind and probably in his promos, even if nobody understood it, he explained it. Um, that's a, that's a step farther, but still, okay, That's nobody can make the case that that was a legendary match in Roddy Piper's career. It was another of the matches that he had. But as you said, not just a, a, for a racist word, but now a, a you know, r this is viewed as objectionable, and not just about race. What about uh, some type of sexual innuendo or what kind of just inflammatory? Remember when TBS actually sent out a memo to World Championship Wrestling, I reprinted it in the Midnight Express book, that the wrestling show should not have gratuitous violence. So you had a company that owned a television program about gratuitous violence telling them not to have any. Was that around a period of time where you couldn't use the term foreign object anymore? Yes, it had to be yes. international <laughs> object. Because Ted Turner wanted to promote uh, global friendship, so you couldn't say foreign, so we started saying international object. Um, it, it, you know, when you and when you start finding some schlub that's never watched wrestling, that has no idea of who these people are, what it was about, what it was about then, what it's about now, any context whatsoever about the thing and just watch this for objectionable shit, then it depends on who's watching it as whether it is objectionable. You can watch any program, especially uh, some of the newer comedies, and not have a context on the characters or the history of the show or things that they do, and they refer to things that you could take in the wrong way, and oh my God. But classic wrestling should be the easiest television to edit that has ever been because no territory is allowed profanity. No territory is allowed at nudity. No territory is allowed at any sexual content past the borderline shit that I used to get. And one time on TBS, I said something. David Crockett actually came and talked to me about it. I said this. I said, and by the way, it was right when Joan Collins, the actress, and her husband, Peter Holm, an Englishman, had just gotten divorced, and also Madonna had just divorced the actor Sean Penn. So I said, 
Madonna has divorced Sean Penn. Sweet Stan could be Madonna's next Sean. Joan Collins and Peter Holm got a divorce. Sweet Stan could be Joan Collins' <laughs> next Peter. <laughs> and David Crockett came and said, no, you can't. This is TBS. That's the So the point is. Yeah, all those promos you did about Baby Doll, gone. Oh, well, yeah, I'm, but see, that's the thing. I never used profanity. I never cursed. I never got sexual, but I was as insulting as possible about her appearance and her character. Um, and I did the same. And one time with Sunshine leading up to the uh, Star Wars at Tarrant County Convention Center in Fort Worth, the 4th of July, 85, when we had that confrontation, I actually cut the promo where I said all the things like she's been on more street corners in the Dallas Times Herald and her first name was Virginia. They used to call her Virgin for short, but not for long. And the, the TV station was going, oh, shit. But at the same time, they couldn't, they didn't need to edit it. I'm not cursing. And, and it's going by so quick. But then I knew one thing. I could either get it by or I knew how to say it where everybody would know what the fuck I was talking about. I ended up one of the promos. I said, boy, I just wish I could say the word slut on TV. And they bleeped slut and everybody could read my lips, right? But point is... And then she had Miro go on Twitter to threaten you. Yes, to threat, yeah. No, actually, she enjoyed that fucking $1,000 check she got for fucking standing there watching Kabuki kick me and knock me out and then pinning me herself without fucking taking one bump. That's what she enjoyed. But anyway, so point is, if you have somebody that doesn't know anything about what the thing has been, and also it's so stupid to begin with to go back and pull stuff out of movies or books or anything that was a product of the time and done in, and maybe for children until they re reach the age of what you know, kids better than I do 10 or 12 and could possibly grasp the fact that this is the way things used to be, even though it was bad. And now things are this way, but we're not going to go back and tear up this movie that a hundred million people enjoy because you know, the, the the doctor was smoking in the hospital room in the movie. They're going to cut all that out too. Whatever the fuck. Things change, people change, cultures change, times change, often for the worse, sometimes for the better. But unless you are using graphic profanity, obscene, vulgar, whatever the fuck, then everything else. Do you know that the first television program that ever had an all black cast and was and starred African Americans on network television has no longer been able to be aired on television for the last 50 years by complaint of the NAACP. Amos and Andy? Amos and Andy. It was pulled in 1966, one of the most popular television programs of the 50s, the first network television program not only just to have an all-black cast, but maybe to have anybody but the stray peripheral character uh, of, of it, as, as a black person on television. And based on the radio program that was created by two white guys that did black voices, right? But they couldn't, they didn't do that. They didn't say, oh, we're going to put these two white guys out there that have had this radio show for 25 years in blackface. They said, we're going to cast black actors and actresses and they did and it was a huge hit and one of the funniest tv shows that's ever been aired on television in any era and they got it pulled because they were mad because it it that would be like if if hillbillies from east tennessee or west virginia campaigned to get the beverly hillbillies banned from television because nobody in their right mind would think that Amos and Andy were a representation of black people as would think that Jethro Bodine and Granny Clampett were a representation of the average white person. So sometimes these, these things you don't go the way that they might, you might think that they would. And I'm just worried. I'll give you another example about here's something that was censored from one wrestling promotion to the other. Remember the, 
greatest hour of wrestling television in recorded history, Mid-South Wrestling, Flair versus DiBiase, the bloodbath where they switched yeah. Teddy heel, uh, switched Teddy babyface. November 85, yeah. November 85, Murdoch uh, fucking came out and turned on him, blah, blah, blah. I was in Charlotte at that point, and Flair was booked to for Watts through Jimmy Crockett, obviously, and... They did that angle leading up to there's going to be another Superdome. Flair was going to be defending the title or whatever, and they were going to do it. But they sent the tape of that television program and that match to Charlotte to insert or do something with to promote something on the television. And the point is, Jackie Crockett, I had seen it because I'd seen the tape, right? Because I got all the VHSs of the different territories sent to me regularly. This was probably in... January of 86 or so. It was several weeks after the match had happened. And Jackie Crockett came in, and I don't know how I was alerted. I think I may have heard it playing in the in the other room while they were looking at it. I said, is that the flare match or whatever? Yeah. He said, it looks like Teddy got run through a razor blade factory. We can't fucking air this. We can't send this. We can't put it on TBS, and we can't send it to half of the broadcast stations in our territory, especially Roanoke, Virginia, right on top of Lynchburg. People have seen one of the local promos I did one time where they actually told the TV station had, had called and said, Falwell's complaining, do not speak so violently on your interviews. So I did a three-minute interview on how I wished I could say all the violent things we were going to do, but I couldn't because of other people meddling in my business. Uh, so they, they wouldn't show the blood and this was a wrestling program, but that was spectacular amounts of blood. So there was even some difference in the territory days between what you could and couldn't get away with on television or what you couldn't show or what they didn't want to show just to not rock the boat. Um, and now if, if you've got some modern day non-wrestling fan, young person, watching old wrestling they could be mortified by everything hey i got one for you when they re-upload mid-south wrestling do you think they leave in bill watts calling you a sissy well that's or i wonder do how much world-class uh wrestling do they have up oh you're gonna talk about the free birds and the confederate flag well no i was gonna talk about the constant (laughs) chance of those oh I'm sorry I forgot. we got to edit that off of YouTube but no I was a I, I was I was a sissy in mid south but Bobby Fulton used to get them to to chant Cornette is a wimp in Dallas but they a ton a ton of those f word chants at gorgeous Jimmy Garvin as I remember uh in that territory back in those days and then also I think there was some of that in WCW. They did the same thing for when the when the Freebirds, Hayes and Garvin, were wearing eye makeup and trying to be David Lee Roth '80s instead of Ronnie Van Zant '70s. They got a ton of those. Um, anything involving Adrian Street, Adrian Adonis, uh, Adrian. Well, Adrian and that wearing the pink dress, the moo moo. That was a bit much anyway. Although it was more flattering for his figure than a form fitting gown. Um, who knows, who knows what these people could have a problem with as relates to wrestling. And that's why, again, the network has been great for the people who have accessed it, who didn't get these VHSs or see it first time around. And it's been great to be able to see all the historical stuff and et cetera, but also it's one corporate conglomerate that doesn't care about the necessarily the art of the situation that owns everything. And if Peacock wants to fucking cut it up, you think they're going to say, no, you can't take that out. That's a classic match. It means a ton to the fans. They're going to go take anything out you want. You gave us a billion dollars. So I'm glad I saved my VHSs. We'll be going back to those pretty soon. I just, I, I, I do not have good feelings. I don't, I, I'm trepidatious. I think, uh, there's no chance Smoky Mountain Wrestling is going to get put up now. <laughs> Tracy Smothers running around with the Confederate flag. <laughs> There's no way. But well, wait a minute. They can't just not show. Yes, they can. Would people, be, would people be that upset about that? 
Well, then, then there's movies. But I got Deliverance. Oh, yeah, Dukes of Hazard gone. Dukes of Hazard. <laughs> it's the same thing. Have you ever seen a movie called Southern Comfort? You know, it sounds familiar, but I'm not sure. Uh, Powers Booth was in the film back when he was a thing, but it was about these National Guardsmen that are deployed somehow on uh, maneuvers or whatever they call it in southern Louisiana and run afoul of some of the Cajuns that live down in the swamp. And that's a disturbing flick. I've got it on VHS. I've never seen it on DVD, but it's it's very interesting. And since I lived in Louisiana and saw some of those locations, you can also see it. It's a very believable film. Anyway. And by the way, you brought up Dave Shearer earlier. I just want to mention here because this Hollywood Reporter article says it was first reported by PW Insider, so we should give them credit. Yeah. And it also has the quote from the Roddy Piper interview from WrestleMania 6. And I think this is important. Like I said, okay. this is why things have to be put in historical context and explained as opposed to just erased and we pretend like it wasn't there. The promo from Roddy Piper was... I hear bad news, Brown. He's talking about Harlem and how he's proud to be from Harlem. Now I could stand here and I could be black. I could be white. Don't make no difference to me. It's what's inside. Huh. So again, I'm not justifying Roddy's decision to go a half black face or half. It's not even a face. It was his whole body. But that's where the content of the promo was uplifting yeah it was we're all equal if you're an asshole whether you're white or black you're an asshole but if on the inside you're a good person you're a good person but that's why i fear just deletion of history as opposed to sitting down and having what could be at times an uncomfortable thought or or talk about it but you need that you need to actually understand things as opposed to this offends me now so let's erase it and pretend like it wasn't there and then also there, as we've seen, some people are professionally offended. If if being offended about something gets them attention, then they do more of it in the future so that they can get some more attention because they got nothing else to do with their life. So now that they know that, then is it going to be that people start writing, well, we don't like so-and-so from 1992, so we're going to write in and tell them that's offensive and they can take that all out. And then it, does it become, okay, everybody gets to chip in on what we take out and edit? <sighs> I mean, you were talking about Asuka earlier. What if someone who is of Polynesian descent, who's a younger person, goes and sees footage of the wild Samoans and says, my God, this is highly offensive. Eat, eating fish and carrying bones around. Eating, you know, the sheik, biting people's ties. This is <laughs> not how Syrians behave. I mean, the, quite, quite the literally, the Syrian lobby will be most upset. Quite literally, I, w I will say this: I've never seen a single Arab American or Middle Easterner behave the way the Sheik did. Has there ever been any ex explanation <laughs> as to why the Sheik behaved in the way that well, he did? Well, no, actually, yes, there there actually was because he was not only he came from a wealthy. Middle Eastern family and had all the money and slave girls and everything that he wanted, but also he was mentally deranged and was uncontrollable at some times and had to have the American spokesperson, whether it be, or not American sometimes, but the spokesperson, the manager, whether it be Abdullah Farouk or Eddie Creechman or whatever, to control him and conduct his business because it was impossible to communicate with this eccentric and madman. Or just because it looked good on TV. But I will say one thing also, by the way, you mentioned the Asian and now the anti-Asian hate crimes or, or the, they have lumped in Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And I have just been alerted to that. The fact that the hate crimes against Asian Americans apparently expand to Pacific Islanders. I would like to see some motherfucker try to perpetrate a hate crime on a Samoan. I would love, I'll sit down with some popcorn for that. If these people are fucking with the Samoans, they got a sad fucking uh, revelation coming toward them. I can't imagine trying to perpetrate any kind of crime, hate or otherwise, against one of the Samoans. So, 
If they're in that group, we may not have to be feel so sorry for the Asian Americans. If they got the Samoans backing them up, it sounds like the goddamn white supremacists and general all around racist assholes are the ones that need to call the reinforcements. I, I it makes sense, but I wouldn't have put the Pacific Islanders and the Asian Americans in the same category. Well, Jim, if I could jump in real quick because we have a correction. What? To, to read on air. We have a correction. We were wrong? You were wrong, yes. Uh, what? Now, wait a minute. Before you throw accusations like that around, impugning my integrity, what were we wrong about? If you remember, on the drive through we had a breaking news update. We received word from Michigan, from handsome Gary Kamensack, that Captain Ed George had passed away. He's not dead? He is, in fact, dead. However, well, what were we wrong about? You told the story about the Funks working in Detroit and the box office being robbed. And I have just received word from Supermouth himself, Dave Drayson, a.k.a. Dave Brzezinski. He has many different names. Yes, some of them uh, federally registered. Go ahead. Just finished listening to yours and Corny's piece on Captain Ed George's passing. Just a correction on the story. Eddie Jr. pulled the box office stunt when Sheik was not there. He wasn't... <laughs> He wasn't on the card that night. Joyce, who is the wife of the Sheik, had said that there was some out had said that there were some outstanding bills that had to be paid for Kobo and other issues before the boys' payoffs. Terry and Dory were standing with Terry Sullivan in the hallway when Eddie Jr. came running into the hallway with his claim. The Funks weren't buying it and said nothing at the time. Sheik would have never allowed that to happen, and he wasn't happy about it when he found out. So there's well, a correction. I'm, I'm glad we got that straightened out. Uh, but So it, it, it happened, but Sheik wasn't around at the time. That's right. It was Ed George Jr., and it kind of implies that maybe he was doing this on behalf of his mother, because as it says here, there were some outstanding bills that had to be paid for Kobo and other issues before the boys' payoffs. So we're not exactly sure. I'm sure we'll hear from, I mean, we got two down, I guess. Uh, well, then why wasn't that the story? Hey, we had some extra expenses. Not Oh, the box office got robbed. Well, between Kamensack and Brzezinski, we have two down. We'll see if Mancuso or Bucantis get in touch with us next to <laughs> let us know their tales I of this story. I have a feeling those stories will be approximately the same as, as the <laughs> other two. And... Anyway, well, I, I, we stand corrected. Yes, you do. Did you ever wonder what it would be like, Brian, if he could just go back to the good old days? We can't watch the network anymore. You don't know about these old stories. If only we had some documentation, something like a, a picture yes, or a portrait or a painting of the way things used to be and the way you liked them. Well, right now, folks, for all my listeners, you can have that in your own lives, in your own homes, through the fine folks at Paint Your Life. At PaintYourLife.com, there is absolutely no risk involved because they are professionals here. If you want a professional hand-painted portrait created from any photo at a truly affordable price, you can choose from a team of world-class artists, work with them on the details, and they can not only take pictures or combine several pictures into one painting to bring generations of your family together. So. Whether it's for a birthday, anniversary, wedding gift, Christmas, whether it's yourself, your kids, your family, a special place, a cherished pet, or all together, whatever you want, let your imagination go crazy, go wild. Write it now at paintyourlife.com. You can get 20% off and free shipping for my listeners if you text the word DRIVE, D-R-I-V-E, to 64000. That's DRIVE. With six, four, and three zeros, drive 64,000. Paintyourlife.com will fix you up with one of these incredible hand painted portraits. And if you don't love it, your money is refunded, guaranteed. So 20% off and free shipping. Text the word drive to 64,000. Terms apply. Available at paintyourlife.com slash terms. Well, you know, Jim, one painting I was thinking about getting for you. It won't be you or me or Travis Heckle holding up our YouTube plaques to signify 100,000 subscribers, but I was thinking about getting you one of you with a bunch of cakes. Well, now, why, why wouldn't it be? 
Well, well now, when you mentioned cakes. I was thinking about you there. with just a, a pot potpourri of cakes all what around is, you. What does Travis want? Because we haven't chimed in with Travis. He might want something for, maybe he and Aiden want hot dogs. Maybe they're, instead of a celebratory cake, they'd like celebratory hot dogs because they like baseball. They like to go out to the park or something like that. Because Big red. I want you guys to be in on this too. There are three awards. There's one for me, one for you, and one for the inimitable Travis Heckle, who does the artwork. And so we should all get I don't want to be the one to be a cake hog. If you if he wants hot dogs, or if you want well, no, you'd pick some of that goddamn pizza with no toppings on it. I was thinking about doing paint your life and getting one for Travis of you drawing a picture of him. Now, wait a minute. Let me hold on here. I got to keep track of this. <laughs> it would be, you would have to take a picture of me drawing a picture of Travis and then send that picture to paint your life who would paint a painting of the picture of me drawing a picture of Travis. Well, no, the beauty of paint your life is I could get a picture of you just sitting down with a pen in your hand and then I could have, I don't know, let's say my three-year-old draw a picture and then I can send both of those pictures to paint your life, so it looks like wait, you're drawing the picture. Wait a minute, why what are you saying I've, I have the artistic talent of your three-year-old? Is that what you're Im implying here? If we're going to be honest, if we're going to be honest, you have beautiful penmanship. We've all Thanks. seen it. I've never seen you draw a single picture. Well, there's a reason for that. Because <laughs> I draw at the box office, but I don't draw on paper. <laughs> that's good. Okay, that's uh, pretty good. But anyway, but yeah, so we'll we'll, we'll let Travis pick uh, what the what the foodstuffs are on these awards. Anyway, that's right. I think it'll be a big red if I had to guess what Travis uh. would want. But Jim, we're about to go to something else that I was really excited to sit back and listen. I didn't even jump in for this one, but it was a great conversation we recorded with you. And John Arezzi, and of course, anyone who listens to the show hears me plug the various Arcadian Vanguard shows, they know that one of the great shows on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network is Pro Wrestling Spotlight Then and Now, where myself and John Arezzi go back and review the original classic landmark episodes of Pro Wrestling Spotlight, the inside wrestling radio show that started in 1989 and broke news, revealed news, and of course is a great time capsule to look at a time in wrestling that was fascinating from 1989 to 1996. And it's such a great time. We have a wonderful time each and every week recording the show. People love it. And John has just put out a book called Matt Memories, and it goes much further than the radio show because John has had several interesting lives in and around wrestling, but in under, and around, se under several different names in and around wrestling, but in and around sports and around in and around the music industry. It's a fascinating book. And uh, it was a real kick to sit back and listen to you guys reminisce. Well, in that case, without further ado, why don't we play the recording of the conversation that John and I had just yesterday and uh, we'll let the people decide for themselves. All right, joining us on the program right now is a guy. I've had a few bones to pick with him in the past over one specific topic, but I still like him for some unknown reason. My blurb is actually on the back cover of his brand new book, Matt Memories, My Wildlife in Pro Wrestling, Country Music, and with the New York Mets, John Alexander Arezzi. John, thank you for coming on the program today. Hey, it's my pleasure to be here with you guys. I really, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. Well, you, you get to talk to Brian all the time because you, yeah. you do the, the podcast together, which by the way, for a plug for that too, you've got so many things going on, John, you're, you're busier now than you've ever been. Uh, pro wrestling spotlight then and now is the podcast where you guys actually go back and replay moments and interviews and things from the pro wrestling spotlight radio show that you hosted and then update it and talk about it in, in historical perspective. But here's a, we got to get it out of way, out of the way at the start. And you, you've been on the show here a few years ago and we talked about it, mm -hmm. but you are indeed patient zero. Yes. Uh, my blurb on the back of the book says, uh, I've even forgiven him almost for being responsible for letting loose wrestling's greatest plague on an unsuspecting citizenry. You are the man unwittingly, however, which is the only reason there was no, 
there was no malignancy. There was there was no malice of forethought in your actions, but unwittingly, you got Vince Russo in the wrestling business. <laughs> Through your fan club president. Through my fan club president. I know we've got a bunch of new listeners and people now are going, what are they all on fucking drugs? But we established <laughs> the last time you were on the program and it's, it's written in your book that Vince Russo was the, you know, average Joe putts owner of a video store that liked wrestling and you got him to be a sponsor of your radio program which led to him getting an entree in wrestling, which led to you actually holding historical place as the first person in wrestling that Vince Russo lied lied to, fucked around, and, and screwed over. But the way that you were alerted to his presence and existence in the world was through Andrew Goldberger, who at the time was what my 14-year-old... Jim Cornette fan club president for like six months. He had, he had written me a letter. that can I be your fan club president? Okay. And one of the first things he does to try to support the wrestling industry is go out and find you some sponsors. And it, one of them happens to be Vince Russo. And here we go. And your thoughts, go. your thoughts on this in the 35 years later or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Andrew Goldberger, who I uh, also is the uh, youngest person I believe ever sued by Herb Abrams. Uh, for <laughs> Tell that little, story. That's his in little, the book. With his little newsletter, uh, you know, Herb um, had bounced a lot of checks. Uh, these are all topics we're covering right now on Pro Wrestling Spotlight then and now. Uh, but, yeah, Andrew uh, wrote in his little Around the Ring newsletter that Herb was bouncing some checks, and Herb decided to sue a little 14-year-old kid. And, unfortunately uh, for, <laughs> for Herb, he didn't get anywhere with it, and Andrew was uh, right and vindicated. But Andrew was a listener, um, just a kind of a nerdy kid on Long Island. Uh, there was something about him. He was an intelligent kid. But uh, uh, I guess he used to like to take walks after school or going home from school. And he passed this video store, Will the Thrill Video, and walked in. There were a bunch of wrestling videotapes in there. And uh, he spoke to uh, the proprietor, uh, one Vince Russo. And then he connected with me and he said, this guy has a lot of wrestling stuff in the store and he would be a good uh, potential advertiser for you. So I reached out to Russo, uh, set an appointment up. And before too long, um, he started advertising on my show uh, in the summer of 1991. And uh, then, you know, he was very aggressive. He really, I guess he really uh, had some aspirations of wanting to do other things since his video stores were starting to tank because of the blockbuster coming into uh, uh, prominence and wiping out all the mom and pops. So um, he kind of convinced me that uh, he would be a good uh, partner. Wanted to start a newsletter up. He said he had a journalism uh, degree. Uh, and uh, and he said that we could reach a... Actually, actually, you misunderstood him. He said, I... I I know a degree of journalism. <laughs> I know a degree of journalism. I'm sorry, Jim. Yes, that's exactly what it was. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, I had a gut feeling that it wasn't – there was something about him that I just didn't feel right about. But uh, at that time, I was looking to grow the show, and he was promising uh, all of these opportunities. Let's get this show to a bigger station and broker a deal in New York City for an, a tremendous amount of money to move this show over. And then we started the newsletter, and on the first issue, on the back page, uh, he said, Pro Wrestling Spotlight, moving to WEVD, co-hosted by John Arezzi and Vince Russo, which he never talked to me about. <laughs> so, uh, that you know, it was kind of an uneasy relationship from day one, and I saw how aggressive he was. And then, you know, as we got into this thing, and of course, we're knee-deep into I like I like the way you say aggressive. We say pushy. We say pushy down south here. Well... He uh he was a he was a bit of both. <laughs> he was uh, definitely that way, definitely that way, and it really started off tenuously right from the start, and especially when we went to New York City and the scandals were breaking, and he had uh, just a different vision. He wanted to do entertainment. He didn't want to do the hard news. I mean, so we were butting heads from the beginning, and and you know, well, I, and I, th I think it's I think it's fair to say that if for the we have so many. As I'm reminded constantly by the people that ask questions that we cover all the time, uh, so many younger listeners or newer fans or whatever, your radio show with the time was groundbreaking because you were right on top of 
It being in New York, you're right on top of Stanford, and that's when the steroid scandal and the trials were going on, and you were reporting on what were about to go on, the investigations, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. All the Donahue and everything. And, yeah. And you were reporting on that in a legitimate fashion, and Vinny Rue wanted to do the newsletter with his degree of journalism. Um where he was, he it was like the the raw magazine that he our articles that he would write later on, where every word that ended in s had to end in z, and he had exclamation points galore and pow sock bam Batman sound effect type writing right. for wrestling, right? And you're trying you're trying to do news on on the biggest promoter in the country getting indicted for steroids, etc. So it was not meshing, no. Not at all. And then when he started contacting the WWF behind my back, uh, that was uh, and that was the that was the end. I mean, it only lasted three months, really. When it, by the time we started the partnership, uh, the time uh, it ended, which was mid March of uh, 1992, uh, I have to say that I might be the smartest person ever because uh, my uh, partnership or relationship. My involvement was only three months, really. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah you got out quick. It, all he all he was able to do in that time was sell you that he was going to be a great sponsor and backer, uh, move you to a more expensive radio show, muscle his way onto the show as a co-host, and then tell you that he was financially embarrassed and didn't really have any money to pay for any of this shit. That's all he managed to do and went behind your back to try to get a, a favor with the WWF and later a job to uh, cut your nuts off on the radio show. Yeah. That's all he was able to do. But anyway, let's move on. Let's move on. Yeah, we want everybody's blood pressure to remain normal. <laughs> um, John, you were you were like all of us, you're like me, Brian, a bunch of us that, that got into business and a bunch more that didn't. You were a fan of wrestling as a kid and – you know, the Northeast was your territory and, and you got a chance to go from a fairly early age to Madison Square Garden and see, you know, the early 70s WWWF and the Bruno and Pedro and et cetera. And not only that, but still have a, some of your eight millimeter films of that, which are so cool because we get to see so little of that era. But you know what? What was what was it like being a fan in the early '70s in New York in Madison Square Garden? It was electric. Uh, they had that age restriction, so you had to be 14 to get in. First of all, I attempted to get in in uh, 1967 when I was 10 to see Bruno versus Gorilla Monsoon, and my dad wow. took me, and we couldn't get in, uh, and that was heartbreaking. But once I turned 14, I got in, and uh, of course, I was a fan watching. And it was electric because not only did you have these incredible uh, ethnic crowds that were always worked up into a frenzy. And I came in, my first show at the Garden was August 30th, 1971 for uh, Pedro Morales against Dan Stasiak. And I was just, I was just uh, mesmerized by the amount of passion and frenzy and almost – near riots all the time uh, when Morales was in there and getting, uh, you know, and getting beat on and uh, before he would stage a comeback and the crowd would erupt. Uh, but that first show I went to, it was actually the only time he ever lost at Madison Square Garden. It was due to blood against Stasiak. And I, I, thought, the crowd, <laughs> I thought the crowd was going to, you know, storm the ring. And they didn't have the barricades or anything around it. Uh, but it drew me in. And uh, not only that, but I had been, uh, you know, like yourself, I'd read all the magazines uh, from the 60s on. I mean, I uh, I bought my first magazine in 1967, but uh, I followed it. And then at the Garden, you'd be able to see like that first show, the Kangaroos were there, who I'd only read about. Uh, the Funks were there, Dory Sr. and Terry. Uh, it was just an amazing time. See, that's so cool, you asshole. Uh, getting to actually having said you got to see Dory Funk Sr. live. <laughs> you call me an because, asshole. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, god dang it. Um, yeah. But think about this, because especially by that point in time, it's outside of West Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, Dory didn't travel that much, but because, you know, he was an integral promoter and part of the NWA and at the time Vince senior, you know, that was when they had 
th- even if they weren't NWA members at that point in time, he was doing business with Eddie Graham. He was doing business with the Funks, he, et cetera. There was an element of cooperation. And you got to see stars like that in the garden, even if they didn't work the rest of the territory. Absolutely. And uh, I'm really blessed to have uh, Dory Sr. on film uh, against Victor Rivera, I believe it was. I and saw I, that on on one of your tweets, I believe. Yeah. Just amazing stuff. And, you know, not only him, but he had Gordman and Goliath come in from L.A. Uh, there were always these things. And Mil Mascaris comes in as the very first mask wrestler allowed at Madison Square Garden. And there were always these kind of surprises, out of territory surprises. Uh, for You know, you get to see Vern Gagne come in. And, and then, of course, when Andre made his debut in 73, it was just uh, magic. And Morales, I mean, every single show, you know, he'd get beaten within an inch of his life and then stage the comeback. And it was very difficult to um, uh, to be there without being pushed around. I mean, the crowd would just surge like every month. I mean, it's it's it was just. It was just amazing to be able. Well, to see it, I've I've always heard the stories that the reason finally why they decided to uh, uh, Morales drew in Madison Square Garden as good as anybody ever, mm-hmm. um, but maybe Bruno might have been stronger in in a lot of the rest of the territory. Yeah, but also there was the problem with uh, e- having riots or you know the heels getting. Cut, it was against Morales in Boston when Blackjack Mulligan got that guy stabbed him at 100 and That's not stabbed right. him, slashed him like 100 and what 40 something stitches. Yeah, that was in 71 as well. That was, yeah, early on in Morales's reign. Yeah, Blackjack, yeah, stabbed. yeah. So they they finally, I think, I've always heard one of the considerations was taking the tie of taking the belt off of Pedro was that. You know, we're we're gonna have trouble. Somebody's gonna get bad hurt. We're gonna have riots. We need to get Bruno back. <laughs> he's he's stronger in Pittsburgh anyway, and and the Italians aren't as as violent as the Puerto Ricans. But um, yeah. But that I mean, it, in every wrestling arena in those days, it was a similar feeling. Of course, not as big as the Garden, because there wasn't twenty thousand people in one place. And you know, but the babyface, the hero, the people lived and died with it, and. If if the uh, I remember many times as a photographer, just as as you were doing here, as as you're about to in your teenage years become a ringside photographer, when the baby fa- the match would be over and the heel would be getting heat on the baby face and the bells ringing and the referee's been thrown out of the ring and maybe the manager's getting involved, as one of the photographers, automatically boom, you're up by the ring and you can't leave because no. everybody's surrounding the ring and the 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 ushers are jammed with their backs to the apron, trying to hold the people back. And the cops are trying to hold the people back. And one night I was at the Louisville gardens trying to get some pictures of the, the heat going on while all the shit was going on over the top of me. (laughs) And a guy came in between me and the usher ducked under us, slid head first into the ring and kicked me in the balls on the way in to, and by the time he was on his hands and knees, of course, I think it was Lawler had football kicked him under the chin and he was toast, but it, it was they wanted to help their hero and and for I just for the homogenized, sanitized entertainment bullshit that goes on today. And the people say, wow, look at how the crowd's reacting. Yeah, they're politely applauding compared to this shit. This shit was a full fledged street fight. Yeah, this stuff was real. I mean, I, I covered when I became a ringside photographer and I went to college in Boston. So I'd go to all the Boston Garden shows. And that place was even wilder than the garden in a lot of ways. And they had to actually put a net uh, around the ring on top of the ring because of all the debris that used to be thrown in there. Uh, and that's, that's right. That- I've, I've heard that it's like the old fishing net thing yes. where, where when they would throw the bottles from the uh, cheap seats, they would yep. catch in the net instead of hitting the guy in the head. Yeah. I mean, it was crazy. And that's the first place that I uh, remember that had plexiglass uh, all around the ringside area. I mean, it was just, uh, it was incredible. I mean, the heat that was there and that was really Italians uh, for Bruno. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, the garden, uh, with its ethnic, uh, uh, support for Pedro Morales. And then when Bruno came back in, it was just, it was, uh, maybe a tad less frenzied, but it was still frenzied nonetheless. But I got that opportunity to, you know, beat the garden for, 
uh, consecutive shows really from August of 71 right through uh, 70, around 77. I went to every single show uh, initially as a fan. And then, of course, uh, I, I kind of uh, talked my way into a press pass. And uh, and that was magic for me because then I was alongside George Napolitano and Bill Apter and the Japanese photographers and, and photographers row at Madison Square Garden was just kind of like magical just to be with those gentlemen. Well, you know, and also you touched on something there. You talked your way into a, a press pass. You talked your way into almost every job you've ever had. And the thing is you, you've in pro wrestling, we'll talk about your wrestling debut in a second, but country music, the New York Mets. I mean, you say in the book, you actually got your, professional name john alexander from the actor jason alexander and i had already but when i got to that part in the book i'd already said this is george costanza except you you went to country music instead of industrial kruger smoothing uh because you (laughs) you literally bullshit your way and and i love you for it into everything you had been a ringside photographer for several years at WWWF arenas and events and somehow still managed to get yourself booked as a wrestler despite having never done same in your life, and they went for it. Tell that story. Yeah, I mean, I was kind of low-key. Like, you know, they knew me, but they didn't know me. You know, the guys on top, uh, Gorilla Monsoon, who was booking. But I, I had a, I had a really good friendship with Ernie Roth. And it was uh, it was during the fall of uh, 1977. I was um, I was um, 20 years old, and I had shot ringside. I had the pro wrestling spotlight radio show at my college station. I shot all the matches, and and I was kind of like I'd love to see what it'd be like to do it, you know. And <laughs> and um, and I talked to Ernie, and I was like, I think I want to give a shot to it. And he was like, Are you cra- Are you crazy? Why Why would you want to do that? I said, I don't know. I just wanted to see what it's like. And he goes, well, where, where have you worked? I said, I've done a, you know, a few little indie shots, you know, <laughs> which really meant that I was like banging uh, kids at college's heads against doorways and asking them to backdrop me after I, you know, was drunk at a party. And I said, why don't you just uh, let me, you know, backdrop me? So that was my experience, you know, it was, it was just messing around. And I, and I, and I promoted, uh, I put on this, uh, crazy college tv wrestling show um you know it, it would be uh, similar to what goes on today outlaw mud shows uh but it was and it never aired on the college station because we kind of destroyed the studio uh so uh, got reprimanded but anyway getting back to ernie and he was like all right i'll you know make a couple calls and and then he uh reaches back out to me and he says uh, january 10th tv philadelphia um you're booked I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I go in the catalog, get my K and H wrestling uh, catalog out, and I Carl and Hildegard. There you go. And I order my boots and my singlet, and uh, and then I show up January tenth, uh, nineteen seventy eight, not telling anyone, no one really. And I show up, and Ernie gets monsoon, and monsoon comes out, and he looks at me like he knew me but didn't, you know, but. Um, but he's like, uh, you got your gear? I was like, yeah. He goes, where have you worked? I said, down south. That was it. <laughs> that's it. See, see, that that's what was funny because, I mean, this is not the first time, or that was not the first time that somebody has bluffed their way into wrestling on some level. Oh, yeah, work some independence or whatever. And I mean, you know, yeah. and it's it's happened in the Southern Territories uh, on numerous occasions. I, I booked one guy that kept bothering me from the Circle K in Morristown one time, and he swore he had wrestled. Um, but in the WWWF, in the, in the biggest territory in the world, that just, your your balls were had elephantitis. Oh, no, without a doubt. And, you know, Monsoon says, heal or baby, you know? So it's like, heal you know and so and then mcmahon who uh, you know certainly recognized me had supplied pictures to him for the madison square garden programs and he basically just went up to napolitano and said i didn't know a was a worker and, 
And uh, well, one, of, one of the pictures, one of the pictures in your book is you in in, in your warm up jacket walking to the ring with Vince McMahon at the uh, junior yeah. at the commentary table with a very disturbed look on his face. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He wasn't happy. Uh, yeah. So uh, and George told Vince, you know, I didn't know he was a worker either. So anyway, I mean, I didn't even know what to do, Jim. I was like, all right, what's next? Because I was always in the back, you know, not in the actual dressing room, but taking pictures of the guys and all of that. And then uh, yeah, because most of the times in those days by the way the even the the official photographers maybe after was different but most of the official photographers in territories didn't go all the way in the locker room you no. there was a there was a a holding area or in some places in all the buildings where you could go where you were away from the people but you still weren't in the inner sanctum no you were not ever in the dressing room the actual dressing room and i, I think that that was for george and bill too i mean from my experiences, they just were in, were yeah. in the hallways, and then we'd ask guys to come out, and we'd take pictures, pose pictures, whatever. Uh, but, you know, and then I asked Ernie, I was like, can you find out who I'm working with? You know, I, I was even afraid to go in the locker room. I really was. <laughs> and then he comes out, and he goes, Dusty Rhodes. I was oh, like, God. oh, shit. <laughs> and then I get in the locker room, and here I am, and then all of a sudden, Sylvana Sousa uh, sees me and he recognized me as take, you know, taking pictures of him. And he knew me as a, as the writer photographer guy. And, and then he started whispering to some people. And before you know it, it's me and Su me and Sousa against Dusty in a handicap match. Uh, and then Monsoon comes up to us and he's like, all right, four minutes, Dusty goes over, you know, you guys work it out. So, uh, so we talk about it and I'm just sweating. I'm just like, I don't know what I'm freaking doing. And, uh, uh, but always in the back of my mind, I said, this would be a good story to write about someday, you know, and uh, uh, if you and live I, through it and I did write a story about it, but it didn't come out until over a year and a half later. I wanted to give it a little time. But uh, anyway, I go in there and we talk out what we're going to do in the match. And uh, and believe me, man, I go into that ring and. I don't know what I'm doing. And uh, we start the match and it's supposed and to get now, let, let me ask you this. Let me ask, because Dusty, <clears throat> Dusty was a very smart man. Absolutely. So probably by the time that you all passed four or five words, he probably knew that, that this was not going to be a, a, a stellar performance on anybody's part. But what right. did he say to you? Just kid, just follow me. You yeah, know, yeah, 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 pretty much. I, I tell you what to do. I I give you some boogie, baby, boo boo boom, and I tell you, rake my eyes, and you stop me for a minute, and they get a little steam, and then I make my comeback. That was kind of generally like that, right? Yeah, it was pretty much uh, spelled out, and and then in the corner, uh, Matt starts and get him in the corner, and me and Susa start working on him a little bit. But I didn't know what I was doing. I'm hitting him on top of the head. I'm I'm like I give him a knee that's a little stiff, and then all of a sudden, like Susa gets thrown out of the ring, and he and he and I char his back is towards me, and I charge him. And he turns around and he just grabs me by the hair and he just looks at me and he was like, I'm going to teach you a lesson. And, 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 <laughs> and his uh, elbows on top of my head were, they, they shook me to my core. <laughs> and I was, I was literally in a fog right from the beginning. And I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, the, they, the they, bionic elbow w could be a, a shoot maneuver if, if he was in the right mood for well, it. Well, he was in the right mood for it. Uh, so, and the whole match was four minutes. And, you know, he's, he, he goes to whip me into the corner and I run into Sousa. I fall down. And later on, on commentary, you know, having the match with McMahon is like, uh, a total lack of uh, a total lack of coordination by this newcomer, John Anthony, you know, and, and so it was just kind of a mess. And then I couldn't even go to slam. I didn't even know how to go with a body slam. So he picks me up dead weight and he throws me on Sousa at the finish and he sits on my freaking head to pin me. <laughs> it sits on my head. I mean, literally, he throws me on top of Sousa and he sits on my head and then gets up. Uh, puts his ring jacket back on with his furry cap, walks to the back, and and that was that, you know. So I was embarrassed, and I had friends at ringside like Michael Mansky, uh, just a legendary fan. Oh, I, I used to be there. pen pals with Mike. Yeah, Mike's a great guy, and he was just looking at me like shaking his head, and uh, I mean I was trying to hide, and then I had to work another match. Uh, <laughs> they actually had me booked for three matches that night. Um, uh, the second match was me and the – uh, Continental Nobleman uh, from Sicily, Joe Turco, and myself against uh, Chief J. Strongbow and Peter M Peter Mavia. Uh -huh. And in the third taping, I was supposed to work against Bob Backlund one on one. Oh uh, my God! Yeah, right. So uh, into the fire I was thrown, but uh, the third match never happened. Uh, I guess everyone knew in the back 
uh, that I didn't know what I was doing. So in the second match, I was told, you know, uh, when we were told what we, you know, what was going on, it would be like eight minutes. It was the opening match. I was not allowed to get into the ring. I had to stay <laughs> outside of the ring. And the whole match was Joe Turco attempting to tag me. And they just beat, it's always it like a comedy match, really. It was like I'd get close to Turco, I couldn't tag him. And then Strongbow would chop me and Mavia would chop me. And then finally, to finish, uh, I was supposed to get thrown into the ring, uh, get tossed into Mavia, who would give me a headbutt. And I'd down, I'd go, and Strongbow gets to one, two, three. Uh, so I, I, uh, that's what happened. I, I got flung in over the top rope. And I think I did okay with that. And then I went into the corner and headbutt. Down I go. One, two, three. Boom. And that was it. I get into the into the back. Uh, Monsoon goes, you're done for the night. And uh, I get my payday of $90. And uh, and that was it. But it was kind of embarrassing. But I, I kind of jobbed my way out of my job. Because then in February, uh, I go back to Madison Square Garden to shoot a very historic night. It's uh, Bob Backlund winning the title from Billy Graham. And I'm there at ringside getting set up with uh, George and Bill and the rest of the guys. And Mel Phillips comes out and grabs me and he takes me. He goes, you got to come to the back. Because in the program that night was a picture of me that George took against Strongbow. And it's in the Madison Square Garden program. <laughs> so uh, so Mel comes and gets me and they come and they say, you can't shoot anymore. I mean, you you were on our TV this, you know, this week. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> You can't shoot at ringside, and that was the end of it. Your one appearance as a wrestler uh, iggies you out of the photography job. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. And actually, I I can feel for you there too because that the same thing happened to me when 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 I became a manager. Obviously, if that had not worked out, I wouldn't be able to turn around and go back to ringside. So I was kind of like, well, I guess this thing needs to go somewhere. Yes. Um, but eventually. Eventually, you you found more of a calling in in wrestling as a promoter, including revolutionizing, or that may not be the right word, re- innovating, bringing to uh, fruition what now is the modern fan fest. You were the there had been fan club conventions and the WFIA conventions. I know you were a member and went to some of them, and I became a member and started going to some of them right after that, you. That's where I met you. The first time I think was that. I think didn't we, place. didn't we came and went because you were, it was early. You were in Knoxville in 78. Knoxville, weren't you? That is correct. Yes. yes. So we were together for one. You had been, uh, you'd won some awards, some of the photography awards. I remember your name in the, in the pantheon of those lists. Yes. Yes. And um, I was on the board of directors in the 78 or 77 and 78. I was on the board at the time. And uh, and boy, were we bored. But yeah. Um, oh yeah. But it, it, there had been, as I said, the fan club conventions, and there had been, um, you know, different get-togethers or personal appearances. I've I got a cool uh, flyer from the Rip Hawk and Swede Hansen fan club that Rock Riddle ran back in the '60s in the Carolinas, where they actually did a dinner at a Holiday Inn. <laughs> mm. <laughs> tip tip the waitress, try the veal. Uh, <laughs> you know, at one point in the sixties, even, but, but you really, it was like, cause of your baseball adventures. Yes. I guess I'm skipping all over the map on your, no, on your life and career, but you had, fine. you patterned the weekend of champions, uh, wrestling conventions that you started after like the baseball fantasy camps and personal appearances and things. And, and you, you know, after that, I wasn't at the first one. I thought the one I was at was your first one. No, and then the I second. realized that it was the second one in hindsight, but you went balls to the wall. I mean, Ric Flair, Buddy Rogers, Luthez, Bruno Sammartino. Too bad you couldn't get any big names. I know. It was tough getting those big names. No, but I, I mean, I started, it was the radio show happened first. I went on the air in 1989 and slowly started building an audience and, and I always used to go to these baseball card shows because I was a huge baseball card fan and I'd want to meet the legends and the Miracle Mets and whoever. I mean, so I, I always wondered why there wasn't this type of platform for wrestling. And uh, then I just decided, to, why not? Let's see if this would work. And and uh, it did. I mean, those conventions were magical uh, in and upon themselves and the, the amount of talent that was booked uh, over the course of the of the four year annual run that I did, Weekend of Champions, 
I mean, it was a who's who at the time when you have Ric Flair doing his very first one and he was very trepidatious about it. He was very I didn't even think he was going to show up when I booked him in 91 because he was just going to the WWF at the time as well. Uh, and it wasn't and he was the only one that didn't sign a contract uh, for that convention out of all the performers. Uh, and then I had a conversation with him a week before and he goes, I'm a man of my word. I'm going to be there. But he he was very uncomfortable about it until he got there. And then he had a really good time. But the Buddy Rogers, he didn't know what the hell it was. And uh, so, I mean, those guys and then later on, you know, Jushin Liger and then, uh, you know, the original Sheik, the one and only yeah. convention he ever did uh, was in 1993. And uh, so, I mean, I had I did it, you know, almost as a fan myself. Who would I want to see if I was a fan going to something like this? And I always um, had a good headliner or a good angle. Uh, the first one was Sting because he just won the NWA world title from Flair. Second one was obviously Flair and all the other legends. Now, the third one was the reunion with Bruno and Zabisco. And then the fourth one was uh, I promoted a show. I had the Sheik, I had Terry Funk, I had uh, Kevin Sullivan, I had Conan, I had Sabu, Chris Candido, Luis Bacoli, Tammy Fitch. Uh, I mean, it was just kind of a, a crazy little a show in a ballroom. Sherry Martell, I mean – it was Medusa. I mean, it was just crazy. <laughs> and it was a really interesting run for me. And, um, Hey, it, I remember with the one I was there, Sherry was working for the WWF at the time, but she snuck in, snuck in, uh, dressed down and with a baseball cap on to visit the boys and just, yeah. you know, hang out. But I'll, I'll tell you what sold me besides the fact that as a fan and, you know, I wish, I wish everybody had a camera in their pocket, uh, you know, back then, like they do now. And also I wish I hadn't, I wish I was older then. I didn't want to be so much of a Mark, even though I was still obviously a Mark and I didn't ask everybody for autographs or pictures or everything that I should have, but just coming down to the hotel lobby at two o'clock in the morning to get changed for the Coke machine and seeing Buddy Rogers and Ric Flair, both at the payphone, drunk calling people. Yeah, was worth the price of admission alone because it was two different generations of nature boys doing the same fucking thing. But what also sold me on on the conventions was the dealer's room. I had been to comic conventions and, and flea markets and comic, you know, things like that, because I was a comic book collector from the time I was a kid. But I had never experienced anything like that devoted entirely to wrestling. And. Because it was the New York area, all those old fans, this was 1990. They had stuff that was 30 years old that they had picked up when they were kids. And they're coming, boom. You remember Big Andy Varga? Yes. Yes. I got all kinds of, the point is, because you booked me there for the Saturday and Sunday convention, I was allowed to go into the room and sit down an hour early. And by the time the doors opened to the general public, I had spent almost twice as much as you <laughs> paid me to be there that weekend. Yeah, and had a ball. You and, were having and I fun. still have all that shit. You were having fun, and that was that was that was kind of the thing for me. I mean, to see see the performers and see the personalities having fun at these things, and everybody had a good time. And uh, yeah, I mean, you, you you could think back, and the only regret I have from it as a promoter and is that I never got a chance to take a picture with the original Sheik, and I never really communicated with him because I. I mean, that suspension of di disbelief, for whatever reason, I wanted to maintain. Yeah. I wanted to maintain it. And I, I you know, Sullivan uh, set up the appearance, and then Sheik is there with Joyce, yeah. and I give her the payday. And I, I, you know, and I didn't even talk to the man. And uh, that was, uh, to me, a regret because I would have loved to have had a, a photo of me and the Sheik. You know, that would have been really, really cool. And, and he was in character literally the whole time, except for a wink here or there. And uh, there was one uh, very famous <laughs> recollection of him taking out the machete and chasing people around the lobby of the hotel. Uh, so you can imagine yeah. what people who were who were staying there, who are not affiliated with the wrestling convention, must have thought when this guy with a turban starts chasing people. Yeah, yeah, a big <laughs> hey, I know exactly how you... I had to have Kevin Sullivan introduce me to the Sheik. Uh, Kevin, it seemed like Kevin was Sheik's PR guy. But when he came in for Crockett, we've told the story in Detroit at the Kobo in 88 for the bash. But in the locker room, I didn't just go up to him because I've, 
I've been in the business for six years at that time, and, and longer if you count the photography years. I'm a main event talent for Crockett Promotions, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't know whether he was going to fucking slice me if I went up to him and spoke to him and expected it, right? But yep. Kevin had told me that he liked, Sheik liked the promos. I had taken some of my promo time on TV because they didn't have him speak, right? So I had taken some of the local promo time to cut a promo on how much I was looking forward to seeing the Sheik's match, right? And Kevin said, oh, Jimmy, he loved those. I said, can, can you introduce me? <laughs> so he introduced me. And then, oh, God, a couple years later, after I'd left WCW, I was at an independent show somewhere, and Sheik was there. And I did, since I'd already broken the ice, and I knew he wouldn't cut me, I had a picture taken of me and him, me with the racket, and him with the United States heavyweight title belt. And that was that was cool. And But I still didn't get too close, just in case. Yeah. Um. Well, you know, we've talked about some of your other careers that you bluffed your way into, young man. Um, but you really did work for the for the New York Mets system. The George Costanza, you know, comparison is valid. And also, as you detail in the book, you were the first manager, or at least, you know, at least an early manager of Patty Loveless. Unfortunately, before she was worth millions and millions of dollars. But you spent a, a lot of time in the music industry and then, you know, kind of rediscovered. Did you rediscover wrestling or did wrestling rediscover you first? Uh, wrestling. Which, which was it? They, people, because you had been out of wrestling and yeah. away from that social yeah. circle for a I while. Was and then, I was gone for the entire decade of the 80s, really, until 89, uh, literally. Well, uh, and then you were gone again for a while. Yeah, I was gone again for 20 something years after, you know, I, I had uh, been burnt out. And uh, you only I, pop I, up I, like a locust, John. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, my whole uh, roller coaster and in and out of wrestling has been uh, a really interesting. Every story is interesting about it. But I mean, in 1981, when I was working for the Mets and, and then I went into a club one night and met Patty, which changed the entire direction of my life, because if I didn't walk into the club that night, I might still be working for the New York Mets. That was my passion. That was my dream. Uh, and then working with her in the 80s and then, you know, after, uh, you know, we parted ways in uh, mid 94 and then when uh, she told me that she had gotten her deal with MCA and I moved back to New York and I started a management company and that lasted re literally from uh, 85, 85 through 88, beginning of 89. And then the partners that I had, I mean, there was, you know, those are all uh, uh, talked about in the book. You know, these gentlemen that I was associated with and what was going on in the music business, they uh, closed up shop. They told me we're out of business. And it was, uh, I was like, what do I do now? And I was like, well, I have wrestling, you know, maybe I could do something with wrestling. I had a radio show at college and I had a failed attempt at starting pro wrestling spotlight on commercial radio in 1985. when we got thrown off the air, me and George Napolitano were hosting it after just two shows. We got thrown off the air at WNYG because uh, we, play so we, we played uh, captain Lou's history of music and, the owner of the station, this little old man, was heard it, and he was like, I don't like this, and he threw us off the air. But anyway, I went back in 89, and that's when I went back in. It was like I thought it was something to fall back on, and I felt that uh, a radio show about the business would be something cool, and I didn't know what was going to happen with the show. I didn't know what it would involve. I just wanted to do something to try to make a living. And that's how I got back in. And then it just kind of uh, progressed. And I was in the wrestling business full time from 1989 till uh, I got out uh, in 96. Well, and over that period of time, uh, you promoted different events, different uh, overseas tours. You yeah. did some work with the Ron Scholar and... Yeah, you know the initial AAA uh, uh, invasion of Los Angeles, where they did those mega gates at the sports arena. Um, you managed a little bit. I didn't really have anything to worry about in no, that not at all aspect of it. But, but you, you, <laughs> prob you probably you you promoted much more successful tours of China than I ever did, though, John. So we've got that going for it. But mm -hmm. you know, you were you were uh, everywhere doing a little bit of everything. And then, uh, then you were gone again. Did you just kind of burn out instead of fade away on it, or did it just 
branched off in a different direction. I burned out, Jim. I was, uh, this was, you know, the scandals. I had uh, enormous financial problems at the time. And then you bring Russo in and that happens. And, and then you're trying to promote and you're trying to stay on the air and you're trying to get sponsors. And, and when I became a promoter, when I started dealing with individuals like Jake Roberts and, and all the <laughs> others and all the others that would just work you and use you and abuse you. Uh, and, and believe me, there were, there were several that were unbelievably kind to me and that I had great relationships with, but then there were the others like Jake who, uh, who basically just, 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 destroyed me mentally i mean he was just he he did a number on me but the russo thing did a number on me and i was bankrupt and i started promoting and i started losing money on shows and i'm like I, my weight was spiraling out of control i was almost 400 pounds and i was sick and i and the thing that got me most is that i'm becoming what i don't like i'm becoming a person that i am disgusted with because you are in a way, working people and you're trying to close a deal. And, and, and I didn't like what was going on. So, uh, and it literally was a show that I did in, I believe it was at the Phoenix state fair, uh, with Mil Moscaris on top and some others that I, I, I lost money. And I was like, I can't, I'm, I'm bankrupt. I'm going to be 40 years old. I have no health insurance. I got no savings. I don't have a freaking car now. I mean, I'm just at the bottom of the barrel. And uh, I started looking for a, a job and I saw a little ad in the paper for a salesman uh, for sell advertising at this little country station. And then I was like, well, I love country music because I really found that uh, music genre. I loved it because after Patty, I started listening to country radio to hear her and I fell in love with country music. So I had a passion for it and I got hired by this little radio station. They gave me a 30 day trial. And uh, I literally, you know, uh, I, I literally just said, please, you know, God or whoever up there, if you give me one more chance, uh, I will always I will always from this day forward do the right thing by everybody I do business with under promise over deliver. And it changed my life. And, and I started making money and my income doubled 96 to 97, 97, 98, 90. And then I get hired by a big radio station in New York in 1998. I become their director of music marketing. I start getting integrated in the Nashville community by taking trips down there and meeting with the labels. You know, I helped Toby Keith get his first New York airplay with How Do You Like Me Now? Uh, so I, I developed a great reputation in Nashville. And then in 2000, I get I get uh, hired to open up the offices for a TV network in Nashville called Great American Country. And uh, I had a really good run there. And uh, uh, that's how that's how I got, you know, left wrestling in the 90s. And I that's when I changed my name. I wanted to put John Arezzi in the rearview mirror. And I didn't want anybody to find me. I just wanted out. And, uh, and country music gave me that platform. Well, and uh, as as you mentioned in the book, also, you know, you were successful there. You could sell ice to Eskimos. You were selling, what, a couple million dollars a year billing in ads and, and more yeah. online. And, you know, uh, you're integrated in music and, and especially in Nashville. Yeah, well, you know, probably from the time you've spent in Nashville now, uh, I don't know if, if I guess music and country music is like wrestling now. Maybe a lot of people have lost the connection with the older generation. But in the 60, 50s, 60s, and 70s, Nashville, the country music artists and the wrestlers in a lot of cases traveled in the same social circles because they were the there was no pro sports then. They were the only celebrities in town. And whether it was there was a, a newspaper clipping that was retweeted here recently where Webb Pierce, the country music singer, got thrown in jail. Uh, I think alcohol was involved and and a fight with his girlfriend who turned out to be Cora Combs, who came and bailed him out. And they met and everybody yeah. knew Cora Combs because she was one of the top women wrestlers. And yeah. Jerry Jarrett lived uh, next door over uh, in Hendersonville, next door to Bobby Bear and... Lawler's house was across from Johnny Cash's across uh, old Hickory Lake. And uh, they knew each other. Do they, is there, 
any semblance now of of wrestling fans in country music, or has has that been lost in Nashville over time? I think that's been lost in Nashville over time. But uh, you know, you bring up a good point with back in the day when the wrestling community and the country music community were kind of embraced because there was an agency there, and you'll know the agency, the uh, Buddy Lee Attractions. Yeah, Buddy uh, Lee. Yeah, who was a huge, probably the largest uh, uh, talent booker for country music uh, for live performances, as well as wrestling, because they, you know, they were. But deep, but before wrestling. for 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 the for the listeners who don't know Buddy Lee, but before that he was one of the biggest girl wrestling bookers because he was with Moolah. Yes, exactly. And then he and then he switched to country music and and uh, you know became a huge name in in that world and. You know, yeah, like I said, there was there was tons of Bobby Bear played under a tent, played a concert under a tent for free in Jerry Jarrett's backyard for his housewarming when he opened that big place up in eighteen thousand square foot mansion in Hendersonville in eighty two. It was just it was surreal. Yeah. Um, but you uh have spent a bunch of time in Nashville and being around the the music business, but also one more stab at wrestling in Nashville when TNA opened up there was once again a wrestling promotion based in Nashville and Dixie Carter had you had a not a brief flirtation i don't want to get that started uh-huh. you had brief interaction with TNA as a result of was it Dixie's connection to PR and PR um, yeah that- she was a she was a very high profile Nashville publicist and then she started TNA and I always had a policy in Nashville and I do to this day open door I'll meet with anybody and I get a um, I get a uh, 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 the receptionist calls my office and said there's a woman named Dixie Carter on the phone and she wants to talk to you and I didn't know Dixie uh, so I, she wanted to take a meeting with me with Jeff Jarrett to talk about uh, placing her TV show uh, TNA Total Impact Wrestling uh, on um, on GAC Country uh, Great American Country, so I I take a meeting and I'm John Alexander I'm not John Arezzi and I kept that kayfabe from them, uh, but they were so they did they didn't actually know who you were when they were no. talking to you in no, relation to no. the wrestling not like you're a goddamn well you know who I am but that you right. had a wrestling background. Well, you know, Jarrett was looking at me kind of cockeyed. I mean, you know, he was so close <laughs> to Russo at the time, too, that I'm like, and she was like, you lo- you have so much passion about wrestling. I mean, you know so much about it. I said, yeah, I've been a fan all my life. I love wrestling. Uh, so the powers that be didn't want the show on the air. Uh, and uh, at that time, they just signed a deal with the Grand Ole Opry to air their broadcast. And they didn't see a fit as a, you know, to bring pro wrestling on, even though Toby Keith's name was batted around quite a bit because he was involved in the very, very beginning. Uh, but that didn't happen. But Dixie just developed a friendship with me. So uh, she would invite me to all the local shows and I'd take my nephew to some of them who was living uh, in Nashville at the time. So my nephew Dominic got to meet all the uh, stars of TNA. And, and it was really kind of a uh, interesting time. And I never, you know, it was a so total kayfabe. And then ironically, I was on an airplane. I was going down to shoot a commercial uh, with Craig Morgan, the country star, and uh, Bush's Beans. I had uh, been part of a deal that was about a $12 million deal to do a huge platform across Scripps Networks who had bought GAC and had the food network and the cooking channel. And uh, we got Jeff, uh, we got uh, Craig Morgan to be the spokesperson for Bush Beans and and I'm on a plane going to or, going to Orlando to shoot the commercial, and on the plane is Dixie Carter, and she sees me. Oh my God, John, how are you? I was like, yeah, What are you doing? I'm going down to Orlando to shoot. I'm going to Universal Studios to shoot a commercial with Craig Morgan, and she goes, Well, that's where I'm going. We're doing a pay per view, and her lot for TNA was directly next door to the lot that I was working the TV commercial. So I was she, there, right? Yes. So I think that's where we were. saw each other for the first time in yes. 17 that, years or whatever and it was. And that she invited me to the show and I'm like with backstage and I'm like holy shit what do I do you know and cuz I know Russo was there at the time uh, but Mick Foley was there Sting was there you I mean there was just like and I really had a I struggled I was like should I you know should I I said what the fuck you know I'm going to do it and I did and I I, I walk across the lot that go into the uh, to the area where, where TNA is, and the first person I see at the coffee truck was Russo. 
And I hadn't talked to him in years. So I just snuck up behind him, tapped him on the shoulder, and he turned around. I said, how you doing, stranger? And uh, he looked like he saw a fucking ghost. <laughs> And well, it was no, just, he, I, actually, he always looks like that. Go yeah, ahead. well, I mean, he was shocked. And he was like, oh, my God, you look great. How are you? Da, 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 da. And then uh, and that's when I saw uh, Bully Ray, who poked me in the back and was like, fucking John Arezzi, what are you doing here? You fucking this and that. I was like, what did I do to this guy? Um, and it was just kind of like he he said he accused me of, like, not booking him on a show. Or, and there was just <laughs> something crazy and so lo and no, behold, I'm no, saying hello to Cactus. Wait a minute, Bubba Ray comes up and he's hot about yes. something from 15 years before. Yes. yes, it freaked me out. I was like, what did I do to this guy? You know, and and then you know, Dixie sits me with her in the front row of the pay-per-view. And I'm sitting there with her and her husband Serge, and uh, Mick Foley's on commentary. And it's a uh, you know, the main event is uh Dudley's uh, against uh, uh Sting and Kurt Angle. So they're brawling outside the ring uh, in front of Dixie where we are. And then uh, the Bubba's, you know, brawling with Sting. And then he tells Sting, throw me on him. <laughs> oh, God. So before you know it, Dixie don't know what the fuck is going on. Bubba, you know, gets tossed over the rail. He lands on me and he starts choking me. And Mick Foley's like on commentary, oh, the heat between John Alexander, radio personality, and Bubba Ray Dudley, <laughs> the heat from 10 years is finally surfacing, you know? So I didn't know what was going on. She didn't know what was going on. And, uh, and well, now that's a, a true words have never been spoken there. Yes. Well, yeah, there you go. But it was uh, it was an interesting thing for me. And that was kind of like a, a taste of wrestling for me uh, during those years in Nashville. But I still didn't tell anybody <laughs> that I was John Arezzi. Well, well, did you, you, you did me. Oh, you yeah, saw, yes. Mick, Foley, Mick Foley and, of course, Rousseau and, a, you know, a couple others. I, imagine imagine that you could say that you are going into a wrestling locker room and one of the only one of the only people you want to share your true identity with is Jim Cornette. That that's something yeah. that most people probably wouldn't be able to say. Um, <laughs> before we talk about what you're doing today in the current day in in and around wrestling, you got to tell the people. As a go-home story, the reason why you need to call Stephen P. New at newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. Sir Paul McCartney stole one of your ideas. I don't know if it was McCartney or was just the, the top brass. At He's involved. I, I can tell he is a no-good idea thief, but I got a kick out of that story, too, when I saw it. that you, Because I've, I've identified with that also, people stealing your ideas. Yeah, it was heartbreaking. I mean, I had uh, I was involved with a charity project, and one of my artists, Sarah Darling, uh, it was a project to raise awareness and raise money for women's breast cancer, and it was in honor of uh, uh, McCartney's wife, Linda, who would passed from breast cancer. And a guy named David Ross, who was a big record guy up in the Northeast, came down, and uh, he put together this album, and he picked a country artist to do uh, uh, covers, renditions of McCartney songs, so the artist I was managing, Sarah Darling, did a uh, a version of Blackbird, which uh, uh, immediately started getting airplay on Sirius XM. And then there was a, 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 a show at the Ryman. And then I had this idea uh, because the, prom the, prom the guy that was promoting it, David Ross, his partner's attorney was very close friends with McCartney, McCartney's attorney. So I had this crazy idea of what if – we get Paul McCartney to come to the ACM awards and bring Sarah Darling on to do Blackbird. And then McCartney comes out and all of a sudden there's an all-star band jamming out to uh, McCartney. And, and it was supposed to be this grandiose idea. And I, I started talking to individuals and everyone was on board. McCartney heard the cover and liked it. And Dick Clark's son, Rack Clark, who was involved with CBS and the ACMs. I mean, and the ACM people, everyone was on board with it. Uh, and, uh, and, and then there was a couple of snags that took place, but, uh, I go to the Grammy awards in, uh, 2012 and McCartney's being honored there. But, uh, at the end of the Grammys, the same idea that we had talked about, here comes McCartney. And then all of a sudden there's an all-star band jamming out to McCartney. And I'm like, that was the idea that we had put together. And then if, Next week, I, I get a message that McCartney decided to take a show in uh, 
uh, I think in South America somewhere, so he wouldn't be able to do the ACMs. And I was like crushed because that was really almost a six month process to try to get that deal oh. done. And, and it just it just exploded and it didn't happen. And, you know, it was close, but no cigar because McCartney is the one guy in my life that if I had an opportunity to meet him or do some business with him, that would be the ultimate. And I could die after that. Uh, but uh, it never happened. But well, was- we don't want you to do that. No. No. You don't have no. to go that far, but it, it, dang that Sir Paul, but it, it, all these stories and many, many more of uh, country music, baseball, the New York Mets organization, wrestling as a wrestling from a perspective of a radio show host, a manager, promoter, jack of all trades, uh, bluff master, all that and more. Uh, Matt Memories is the book by John Arezzi. It's on ECW Press. You can buy it. Wherever people buy books these days, if they do indeed buy books, that's the way they need to buy more of them. That's why the population is being dumbed down. But what else are you doing? I know you got you got Brian's ear at least once a week or so uh, with the podcast. You've uh, I've been seeing you tweeting. You've been converting some of your uh, classic eight millimeter film footage of the garden and et cetera that you shot. You know, you've got all kinds of projects going on. What's what's the main parts? Well, the main part is the book right now. Of course, uh, April April the sixth is the official release date, but it is out. It's being shipped by Amazon. Oh, so I I was special. Yes, I got one before the average American bear can. That is correct. Okay, but that's the main thing. I mean, Matt Memories, and if anybody wants a signed and numbered autograph copy, they could email me at John at mattmemories dot com. But the book is part of it. And Jim, I mean, I don't know what's next for me. I mean, uh, I I am back in wrestling. Um, you know, it, it it is something. I don't know what the future holds. I mean, there's some talk now because I literally documented everything in my entire life on video, on film. I have all of these archives. I have about 10,000 negatives from Madison Square Garden and all the East Coast stuff. I have uh, tons of shows that uh, when I was a promoter that people have never seen. I got Lucha stuff that people have never seen. All of these archives. And and then there's been some talk. uh, A couple of people have reached out to me. And because of this crazy life that I've led and these different personalities and country music, baseball, wrestling, that they think there's a potential documentary on the things that I have done in my life. And I have documented everything. So, I mean, that could be something that comes next. I don't know. I mean, I'm 64 years old. I am. um, uh, I can't get back in the music business because I've aged out of it. And I don't like dealing with the artists in in today's generation. I think they're just uh, that's another whole story. But I, I just don't enjoy that anymore. The business has changed so much. But we'll see. I mean, I'm open to opportunities. Uh, I love doing the podcast with Brian. I mean, it brings back uh, this history from 30 years ago. Every week we do it in chronological order, and it's funny, and we have characters that have developed from this show. And I'm listening to these shows for the first time in 30 years. So it's kind of like it's like this jolt to my memory. Uh, So I'm enjoying all of that. I mean, I, I enjoy the podcast more than anything. And the book was uh, – I'm proud of it, and we'll see where it goes. And uh, whatever else is next, I don't freaking know. John, you may be patient zero in the wrestling business, but you are also probably the only person I can think of that has been in the wrestling business and changed their name that many times, none of them to stay ahead of the law. <laughs> 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 um, thank you for being a part of the program. Good luck with the book, Matt Memories, and and thank uh, thanks to Greg Oliver, also your co-author, who we need to uh, yes give him some love here. He does some great stuff as well with the Hall of Fame books and etc. But anyway, um, we will listen to the podcast Pro Wrestling Spotlight then and now. We'll get the book on April sixth, and we will have you back uh, under another assumed name at some point <laughs> when you. When you decide to bluff your way into something else, how's that? That sounds like a plan, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, John. Well, there it is, Jim. Your conversation recorded yesterday with John Arezzi, of course, the man who brought everyone pro wrestling spotlight, the originator of the wrestling convention, but more appropriately today, the author of Matt Memories, available right now via ECW Press, wherever you find your favorite books. Well, no, he just said it went on sale until April 6th. You can order it right now. Oh, you can order it. They just won't send it to you. Well, I think they're actually like, mailing out early copies depending on they? where you well, buy then, the book. Well, then fuck. Just go ahead and buy the thing now then. <laughs> That's right. 
If, if my store is closed, you need something to do with your money. Anyway, it, it's good to hear John's doing well and he's healthy. You know, his, his weight has fluctuated, like mine, but I never got as big as he was at one point. But he's come down now. He's, he's healthy. We all got to get healthier. We all got to watch our diet get healthier, especially in the era of COVID. And now there's a way to do it easy thanks to our fine friends at Athletic Greens. And we've talked about them so much. One tasty scoop of Athletic Greens contains 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients, including multivitamin, multimineral, probiotic, green superfood blends, and more. It increases energy and focus, fills the nutritional gaps in your diet, aids with digestion, supports a healthy immune system, and all you have to do is just scoop some of this stuff in, throw it in the water, shake it up, and boom, drink it down because it's lifestyle friendly. If you're in the lifestyle, they're friendly to you. Whether you're eating keto or paleo or vegan or dairy-free or gluten-free or anything else, it's just not taste-free. It's not taste-free, folks, and there's less than one gram of sugar. You like it because you don't mess all your blenders up when you juice everything in sight. I like it because I wouldn't go to the, through that much trouble to begin with, but this is easy. And right now, if you go to athleticgreens.com slash JCE, you can get a free year's supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs of Athletic Greens with your order by going to athleticgreens.com slash JCE. And the big thing is you stay stocked up on your vitamin D through Athletic Greens and the vitamin D booster they send you, and that supports your immune system, which, of course, helps until you can get your vaccine for the COVID. So this all works together. You got to keep things functioning and, and keep your heart pumping. Keep pumping your heart. That's what you need to do. That's what you do need you, to do. Do you pump your heart often? Uh, sure. Sure. Any, anything goes here. All right. Well, what are you doing on your programs this week besides pumping your, your heart or whatever? Another exciting week on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Get information about all the shows on Twitter at Super Podcasts or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. And don't forget... You can join in the conversation if you want to talk about or learn about classic wrestling. Go to tinyurl.com slash wrestling history forum for Arcadian Vanguard's kayfabe memories message board. Also want to make mention of the Wrestling News Archive on Twitter at Wrestling News AV. We just posted some pictures that people really were shocked by. I guess people who are newer fans. Photos taken by you, Jim Cornette, of Hulk Hogan when I guess he was using Manscaped to groom his <laughs> chest hair in a very interesting look. Any memories nobody, of those photos? Yeah, well, yes, obviously. Nobody remembers uh, these days, but for the first couple of years when he was Sterling Golden and then Terry the Hulk, or Terry the Hulk Boulder and then Sterling Golden, in that order, uh, he shaved a mushroom cloud on his chest hair. People don't think now Hogan has chest hair, but he was he had a hairy body, but he shaved it. And, you know, he's tan like the bodybuilders are and everything and oiled up and everything. But he had a mushroom cloud shaped or shaved in his chest hair that went to a point right as it went down into his trunks. Who knows what it was pointing at? You know what else was pretty cool to find in the uh, Hogan file? I found some photos, some really early photos of him and his brother, Eddie Boulder, of course, Brutus Beefcake. Yeah. Taken by Brian C. Hildebrand. Yes, he took them same. He was next to me when I took the same pictures. That was it in Memphis, the Monday night of the WFIA convention in 1979, and all of the photographers were there. Me and Brian were uh, next to each other at ringside. And when the Freebirds came out, they played Freebird for the first time. And Hayes comes out doing the slow motion strut thing and the silver robes and all that shit. We see, you know, this music thing could catch on. <laughs> well, once again, check out some of the archives. We also, for those of you who are more classically minded, put up some Jim Londis, Ed Strangle Lewis photos. Go to at Wrestling News AV on Twitter. But a few notes about the shows this week. This week on Breaking Kayfabe with Bowdrin and Barry, the boys talk with Jumping Jim Brunzel, of course, of AWA and Killer B's fame. It's a great interview, including... Jim's telling of the story of what happened in the locker room between Dan Spivey and Adrian Adonis. 
Ooh, check it out I've forgotten today. about that one. At BaldrinPod.com, of course, Breaking Kayfabe with Baldrin and Barry, available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. I also want to make mention of the latest episode of Charting the Territories with Al Getz and John Boucher. This, of course, always being a very interesting look into the McGurk territory, Watts' territory, what we would classically call the Mid-South Wrestling territory. Before it was Mid-South Wrestling, this week, a look at the first quarter of 1973. And some of the wrestlers, including Dennis Stamp, Bull Bolinski, Johnny Eagles, Chuck O'Connor, as well as Corsica Joe, Nikita Molkovich, the Royal Kangaroos, and Sonny Roughhouse Fargo. If you're into wrestling history... Now, wait a minute. I saw a tweet about that, and you don't have to go into the hold. Was Roughhouse wrestling there, or was he refereeing? You have to listen to the show to find oh, out. God damn it! Check it out today. It's always a unique way of looking at wrestling history. Al Getz does research that no other historian has done. He's got results that no one else has. And he, of course, applies his unique analytics to them. Check it out at chartingthepodcast.com. It's also available, Charting the Territories, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And, of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! Thank you. Opening day Star Wars later this week, where we discuss baseball and wrestling. It's always an action-packed show. The last several years, Kevin Sullivan has incorrectly picked who he thought would win the World Series. We will never let him live down the year he picked the Yankees and his beloved Red Sox won. Find out what happens on this year's show. It'll be up later this week for opening day at 605pod.com. Available wherever you find your favorite podcast. Go through the archives today as we get ready to kick off a big season of new episodes of the 605 Super Podcast. The Mothership! God damn, you've started doing that twice now. Let me start it. I've always been doing it twice. You used to slack off on the second one. The Mothership. You gotta keep now you on your now toes. You're, just, you're just hurting me. I'm sorry. All right, uh, and we'll get to it uh, now since we've talked about as much other wrestling as we can besides this. Um, and I will surprise you with a statement I'm about to make about the AEW television effort that aired on March 24th. Do you know who was in what I consider to be the best match on the program? Now I'm trying to remember. It's been a few days. What was... <laughs> <laughs> what were the matches? Who was in the best match that you thought? I don't even remember who wrestled until we start doing the review. I can't remember. Kenny oh, Omega. Geez. You don't you don't take notes like I do? No, I do it off the top of my head. Kenny Omega. You are correct, sir. Kenny Olivier, Twinkle Toes McFinger Bang. Of course, it wasn't his fault. But of the <laughs> matches on this program, his was the best one of them. Interesting. Um they started out with the world title eliminator, uh, which is, I don't understand how it's an eliminator when if you beat the guy, you get a title match, right? It's not a, like an elimination tournament or whatever. Anyway, they, they like their verbiage. What you're not understanding is that Tony Khan can't book. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess I'm not understanding that, but once you got past the ludicrous, ridiculous entrance the over-the-top introduction by ring announcer george hamilton roberts the stupid dancing broom girls dressed up like olivia newton john in a 40 year old workout video etc that blonde is cute oh for heaven's sake what olivia no the dancing broom girl they never I even have they ever explained on tv why they have brooms no because the minute nerd audience that watches this program obviously knows he was the cleaner in Japan. But that's my question. Was that, I knew that based on the nerd audience, but has that ever been explained to anyone watching the show? I couldn't I remember. Would, if it I was. would be more than happy to be open for correction, but I ain't heard it. And, and it may be in passing if, if excrement would say, yeah, I was the cleaner in Japan. Nobody, they, it's stupid. It's stupid and comedic and low rent, and he thinks it's getting him heel heat with their audience, uh, when in actuality, it's another of the many things that prevents anybody else 
I thought in 2009 that Ring of Honor had a had great talent on the roster, but what they did was such a private club that was impossible for just a casual observer to understand what was going on. They take it here to a whole new level in AEW is all I'm going to say. But anyway, once they actually started the match, I the first thing I wrote, they tried to wrestle. I think that Matt Seidel has good influence on the mute Marx brother because this was the closest thing to a logical, sensible wrestling match that I've seen him have. And he was fairly serious about it. I mean, he can't. He still makes funny faces, but he's not doing it on purpose. That's just his his fucking face. Uh, but it, Olivier's personality, the facials, the body language, etc., that he's to make him a heel naturally, and now he's exaggerating them more as you should to be a heel. But he still doesn't either wrestle as a heel or a baby face to me. He just does the same moves either way, but maybe with a different expression on his face. Um, but Seidel is a, is a flipper, but he's more polished and more experienced than your average AEW roster member. Um, he takes those great bumps when he, you know, as we've seen when he slipped on his debut coming in, trying to do a something off the top rope, he can crash and burn spectacularly, but he was on here, took a great bump off of Twinkle Toes' clothesline. Uh, made a nice comeback at that hurricane run off the top rope, a nice brain buster. He had a, a nice, several nice false finishes on Harpo. Um, there was, a, and then there was that one point where Harpo countered the hurricane run off the top he was going for, and Seidel came down on the top rope, ass first, and flipped over and read. That was a nice bump off of that. Um, Seidel is the first person I've seen that actually sells the tulip suplex or snapdragon suplex or whatever is suplex like it actually is vicious and hurts. Everybody else just rolls through and pops up. Um, Seidel hit a cool roll up. I was seeing a bunch of nice stuff from Matt, Matt Seidel that I've not seen in this match. He hit some nice kicks and another big false finish. Uh, this was one of his better efforts uh but then finally Seidel tries the meteora where i don't know how they do this without killing them the the guy that's giving the move killing himself but the meteora where they jump off the top or whatever and put both knees in the guy's chest and ride him down now i can see where the guy taking it can get out from under it but the that's punishing on your knees anyway but Olivier catches him and gives him a buckle bomb and then a power bomb. Boom. And it was fucking great. And then didn't cover him. And then did one of those Canterbury knees where he does the little horse canter and, you know, gets the happy feet, gets a two count. And then Seidel comes out with a reverse hurricane Rana and goes to the top, but Olivier trips him. And then everything comes to a halt while Olivier emotes and hits more of those stupid little fucking knees that look like shit. And then went for the one winged fairy, but Seidel countered it into a roll up. And at that point, I said, they've jumped the shark on this now. They put together a tremendous sequence. The Meteora, Olivier catches him, buckle bomb into the power bomb, cover the guy one, two, three. You're going to win anyway. But instead, they go back and they do the more, and then they come to a halt, and then they do some more. And then Olivier hits another knee and then hits another one. The final, the one winged fairy. If he'd have beat him with the power bomb, it would have been perfect. But they've always got to overstay their welcome and get too busy. But however, having said that, this was Twinkle Toes' best match I've ever seen. Because oh, come on. Wh what? It Who was really the good, but better than the Okada matches? Well, because you've always, every time that Olivier has too much time, he he does his goofy shit. Uh, of course, the Okada matches, Okada's good, but they went way too fucking long and way too fucking far and overstayed their welcome way too past the expiration date with the constant never-ending, never-ending-a-match false finishes. 
And also, when you give him enough time, he's always going to do those butt plug faces. He's always going to do something that doesn't make any sense. It was contained here. It wasn't too short. It wasn't. It was just a little bit too long. But grading on their normal curve, they didn't do too much. Uh, nobody was silly except his entrance. And Sidell was remarkable. So I said, this is the this is the. I can't say I ever enjoy Olivier because he still wrestled a sex doll in front of a crowd. So he can always, to me, burn in eternal damnation. But if you got to watch the fucking guy, this is the least I've ever disliked it. If he ever apologized for wrestling the doll and admitted it was a mistake and he was young, would you forgive him? Yes. Let's have somebody come over and apologize to me for hurting one of my dogs. The guy that lives two doors away from me is the son of the guy that lived there in 1967 that had a dog that killed one of my dogs, and the Cornette family and, and his family have not spoken in 56 years. Oh, wow. And, and he's 500 feet away from me. You think I'm going to forgive Twinkle Toes for fucking shitting on the business in front of people? Fuck him. Anyway, what would you think about the rest I, of the match? <laughs> I'm surprised that you liked it because I thought you and I were going to have a fight here because I liked it. I hate, hate, hate the entrance. Yeah. Like I said, the blonde dancing girl, very pretty. However, if you held a gun to me, I couldn't tell you what any of them looked like or what color any of them's hair was. I just see the brooms and tune out. My point is everything from Justin Roberts' ridiculous intro, which again, it happens, but that's another thing. It's never been explained why it's happening to the dancing broom girls in what would you call it? 80s workout gear? I don't even know what to call it. Fluorescent workout gear? None of this makes any sense. None of it's ever explained. And to me, it's stupid. I hate the entrance, but I thought it was a really good match. I really, really liked it. it just, you wonder when you watch the entrance, where's the dancing bear? And 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 have a seal come out and sit up on a fucking stool bouncing a beach ball on its nose you're giving, anyway you're giving them ideas i hope you realize you're giving hey well them... hey <laughs> sea it's world just, is not that service, far away <laughs> it's a service i provide for you know the underprivileged uh, people who are short on ideas who don't have enough ideas to eat i donate some ideas um i will pass over the fact that officer bar brady was with the entire assembled dork order except to say that Cole Cabana is just hiding in the back of that group and laughing and saying, yeah, every once in a while, so that nobody notices he's there as long as the check is clearing. That's what it looks like to me. It's funny. I was going to say that if you remember when he first got there, my first instinct was to groan. I like, go, oh, of course they signed Cole Cabana. But then I actually thought, you know, he's doing really, I've never enjoyed Cole Cabana in the ring like I have in AEW. He's kind of been used all right. And, and, it, and, and actually, you could, you could have ended that sentence with a period. For me, I've never enjoyed Colt Cabana. But, but I, like you said, at, at the first, in the early AEWs, everybody else was so much smaller, so much sloppier, so much sillier, that he, the, the, the fact that he can work if he wants to showed through. But since that time, he's been in the Dark Order. And what has he done? I mean, again, we don't watch our crappy YouTube shows. So I don't know if he's wrestling on there. But Cole Cabana is a guy who has some personality. When he wants to be serious, he can be serious in the ring. He always seems to get a reaction from that AEW fan base or the type of fan base that AEW attracts. They're doing nothing with him. He's just in the background. Like you said, he's another one of the goofs in the Dark Order. Hey, Ed, Ed, Colt, we actually, one time we were able to use Colt Cabana and Ring of Honor to his strengths. Uh, it, no comedy, no stand-up bullshit, no hip-hip-hooray fucking facials in his matches. He studied the world of sport wrestling style and spent quite a bit of time in England. And when we had Dave Taylor come in, I think it was for the WrestleMania weekend shows in Atlanta, they had a nice world of sports style match and it was serious and, and good. And he was Colt is able to do that stuff, but he wants to be a stand up comic wearing a gas station mechanics outfit. Anyway, 
the next match was Adam Page against Cesar Romero. And now I looked at this Caesar fellow with different eyes. Remember, I said, isn't he one of the, the last time we saw him, I said, isn't he one of their, I guess, wrestling school students? He's a big guy, good body, looks good, just real green. Real big. And real big. But then somebody, I don't know if you saw this or not. Maybe it was a tweet I read at an unrelated time, but somebody said this Caesar, what is his name? Caesar Bonini? Benino? Is it Benino or Benini? Whatever. He's apparently, if they're telling me the truth, and I'm once again willing to be corrected on this also, he's been in WWE developmental. He's been wrestling for several years. And and he's been around. And now that I saw or heard that, I'm like, oh. When, when I thought he was still in wrestling school and they were putting him on television for the first time, I said, well, this guy's got potential. But if he's... If he's been around that long and been in developmental or whatever, good Lord, he needs to find a new profession because it ain't going to get better. He's green and he's awkward. Anyway, this was shortened to the point and what it should have been. Uh, he, you know, Paige, they had a little match. He got a little steam on Paige and at least it was baby face and heel. You could tell what was going on there. Paige made a comeback, hit the buckshot Larry at one, two, three. And it was what it was, so it wasn't offensive, I guess, is the the grade on this. I got nothing else I got to add to it. Um, explain to me what Lance Archer said. Lance Archer, no Jake. So that's. Do you remember a time when you would never see a heel wrestler without his manager? Well, you saw where Jake was, That's right? That's the package. Jake was well, sitting in the front row in the audience. Well, but Lance Archer is in a pre-tape in the back without his manager. But Jake had good seats this week. Oh, <laughs> he sure. was going to get there early and get in the front row. I guess, I guess it is open seating, festival seating, so he didn't want to lose his spot. But anyway, he's in a trashed warehouse cutting a promo on Sting, but... I don't know whether this is something that he thought of he had in his head and and it it made a lot of sense to him or whether probably more likely they told him to say this and he nobody understands it. He was basically saying Sting is great. Sting is an icon and that's why people are going to remember Lance Archer. Did you get any other? No, it made no sense. It made no sense. All around? And and boy, did he not seem intimidating. No, but but that's the thing. Even if even if he was say Sting is a legend, Sting is an icon, and when I break Sting's bones into a million pieces and do this and do that, then I that's why people are remember it. Ju- it didn't connect. It didn't come together. And then, of course, on the interview program that we had this week, I, I always when they have matches, I want more interviews. When they have interviews, I want more matches. Because there's probably a reason for that. Uh, Tony Schiavone was with Dr. Britt Baker uh, in a live promo. And I will say this, with the exception of Selena De La Renta, she is probably, Britt Baker, probably the best female heel promo in the business currently. And I didn't watch any of this because I didn't want to think about that garbage outlaw mud show match they had last week, much less hear her talk about it or continue fucking reminding me. So she's wonderful, but I'm so between the tooth and nail and the girls garbage death match. I will pay money not to see anything involving Brett Baker, Britt Baker. Okay. It's just ridiculous. So I'm sure it was a very good promo. I, I heard her at the start before I realized she was going to talk about that thing and started skipping ahead, but she is very good. But I, eh. now we go to another interview, the interview, 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 break it up once in a while, kids. Um, But Brian Pillman, Griff Garrison, and Dante Martin, the babyface team about to be in the six-man, is standing in the back hanging out with Christian. And Dasha breaks in, and Christian did all the talking for him, and that's probably a good thing. But he put him over a little bit, and they're just, you know, 
shooting the shit, talking some shop, and then in comes Kazarian. The last time we saw Kazarian, and most of the times that we have seen Kazarian, was Kazarian not a babyface? I believe he was. Again, you know, some people in AEW, Cody Rhodes, say that there are no baby faces and no heels. But I believe we most recently saw him with SCU, him and Daniels, not necessarily Scorpio Sky. And they were a babyface team teasing that if they lost another match, they would break up and then we've never seen them again. So I don't know what the hell's going on with them. Well, even though they think uh, they are under the mistaken assumption that there are no baby face and heels or that there shouldn't be um was kazarian a smart ass anytime we've seen him presented before because now he comes out and he's snotty with christian over the catchphrase when does the work start so now he wants to get him a lunch box and you load 16 tons what do you get Another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, won't you call me? Cause I can go. I owe my soul to Tony Khan. Dee, 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 dee. He's a working man. When does the work start? This is their beef. This is their issue. He's known as the workhorse. And now Christian comes in and wants to be a workhorse. And so Christian challenges Kaz. Kaz makes some more snotty comments. And then they're going to have a match next week. It, it, it was a good interview exchange between the two of them, but confusing as usual, because if Kazarian is now going to be a fucking snotty, wise-ass, smart-ass heel, okay, i just like to know from one to the minute to the next. <sighs> Um, I'm sure it'll be a good match, but I'm not sure why we're supposed to really care. Exactly. <sighs> Just because you don't have baby faces and heels on the left and right side of the talent roster, like normal promotions do, like every promotion since the dawn of time, here's your list of heels, here's your list of baby faces. Just because you've got a, just a list of people. Uh, doesn't mean that you just change their personalities from week to week on television based on a, a funny idea you have for them to cut a promo. And what are they arguing over? Who's better in terms of work rate in the ring? Because, but yes, because Kazarian said he was the worker. He was the workhorse. He had the work, whatever. He's known for that, even though he's never used that catchphrase. It, no, he's not known for that. He's never been known for that in AEW. Nothing against the guy, and he's good in the ring, but... At what point was it ever in a company with Omega and all these other guys, the best in-ring guy, that's Frankie Kazarian? Well, no, they're still not saying the best in-ring guy. They're just saying the hardest worker. I know a lot of people work hard and can't get shit accomplished because they ain't any good at it. Anyway, and we come up on a six-man tag. Dax and Cash, FTR and Sean Spears with Tully and Wardlow and MJF against Brian Pillman, Griff Garrison, and Dante Martin. And apparently, in hindsight, this whole match was designed just to let Sean Spears win once. Because you've got FTR, you can establish the heel team. And you've got Pillman and Griff Garrison. They are a regular babyface team. Or anybody else give FTR a win, but no, they got to do a six man just to expose the flunky of the group and let him win a fall for the first time ever. Um, Dante Martin, Dante Martin, of course, is part of top flight, but his brother, I guess, is injured. Um, but Jim Ross said that he had never seen a 20 year old as good as Dante Martin. And you know the immediate thought that came into my mind. Which one? Terry Gordy. You know what? That's, that's But true. then I realized... That's true. Terry Gordy was 19 when he was in Mid-South Wrestling with the Freebirds. <laughs> so... Well, maybe Jim Ross... But Jim Ross may be telling <laughs> the truth because he wasn't working for Mid-South Wrestling. He was working yes. for Leroy McGurk, so maybe he didn't see Terry Gordy. Uh... He saw him plenty of Terry Gordy. 
Anyway, and and Spears, they've changed his hair or something again. He looks like Billy Gunn imitating a Q-tip. Um, but anyway, but I can't knock Spears' work in this. It was very solid, and they FTR integrated him in some of the, the tag team moves, double teams. Spears and Dax, right off the bat, did a perfect blind tag, hand-to-hand -hand behind the baby faces back. And then the baby faces turned around and did one, a back slap blind tag, which was not right. And I liked the little thing they did where all the baby faces were going to dive and Wardlow got in, in front of the heels on the floor and they stopped. Thank, I, anytime a dive is foiled and it doesn't happen, I'm a fan of it. But this was they treated this like a throwaway match because they went to the break within a couple of minutes of it starting. Um, they come back and it didn't go too long. FTR makes whoever they're in the ring with look better because they're probably all around the most accomplished and professional in-ring talents in this company. But the finish was fairly decisive. Spears just fucking hit Martin with a nice little finish. Boom, one, two, three. But they had to, they had to let Spears win once because he's in the top heel group. And can, can you remember ever seeing him win a match? How about the fact that I had forgotten this was his gimmick? The chairman where once again he walked out just holding a chair because, of course, he hit Cody with a chair two years ago. Yeah, and He's busted the him chairman. Over. The chairman. Get out of here. If you're going to try to revamp the guy, revamp the guy. Remember when they fucking, when he hit Cody with the chair and busted him open, they could have capitalized on that because it was a vicious gash, and instead they came out and said, well, no, Cody said it's my fault. We gimmicked the chair. It didn't work. And fucking made that fight. Made, he really got fucking stitches in his head and told everybody it was still fake. Not the stitches, but the the act of the doing it. Because they're all fucking lunatics. So anyway. Uh, but then explain to me what happened. If you if you saw this, if you were paying close attention, one, two, three, the heels win, baby face are selling, Tony Schiavone steps into the ring, and Wardlow goes around Shivani and grabs Pillman by the neck and look, went to give him what looked like a choke slam or something off the ropes because Pillman was sitting on the top turnbuckle and suddenly he just fell off the ropes in a heap and they just kind of chucked him out of the ring. Yeah, I don't Did know. you see that? What I have no idea what was going on. Um, But anyway, then they do an interview and Cash... Snatched the mic away from Tony, and Tony backs up like, "Well, oh, fuck again." We just covered that on the show last week. But then Dax grabbed the microphone and gave it back to Tony and told him to hold it. <laughs> I did. And pop he, for, I did pop for that. I have to. Admit. Yeah, and he was on a roll, and he talked. What is this Jericho and SNL skit? A rom com? And then MJF cut the promo on Jericho and challenged the inner circle to come out, uh, which is a heel move. Cause of course they weren't going to, they're all injured and beaten up and everything and bullied tone at Tony around. This is the top heel group that the inner circle should have been. And just very briefly, we've said it before. They all look like they belong together. It's not like a motley collection of completely misassorted people. Jericho doesn't look like he'd have anything to do with Wardlow. Doesn't have anything to do, look like he'd have to do with, Santana and Ortiz, these guys all look good. They're all fresh faces somewhat, except for Tully, obviously. Um, his freshness expired a while back, but he's a legend. Uh, and, and they're being serious. This is a, a top heel group. Imagine, well, they couldn't have done this at the start because they didn't have FTR, but if they wouldn't keep starting groups or similar gimmicks and then redoing them or re revamping a guy after he's already been on television if they started him out the right way to begin with some of this shit would have took traction but because nobody's consistent everything is so similar kidnapping angles and and all the other kind of similar things they do in every segment and the similar kind of groups and the constant multi-man matches nothing it doesn't register but this this group standing alone looks fine what do you think i again we'll see how things play out i don't like spears with these guys i think like you said we've never seen him win he's been a guy on the show that you can't really take seriously 
A lot of people figured out why he was there in the first place. We'll see how things play out. Maybe they could change my mind. But Uh, the only thing I'll say is I think this was a unique opportunity after they blew it with FTR's booking for so long and after MJF has been stuck with garbage for way too long. This could have been cut off way sooner. And you're also trying to repackage or make people care about Spears. I thought they should have come out of the gate and just destroyed these guys. I thought they yeah. sold too much, especially early on in the match. FTR, that is. Yeah. That's my only thought. It's, it's, it's amazing. It used to used to be that wrestlers had to go to rehab for alcohol and drugs. Now they need their gimmicks rehabbed. They're all straight, but their public persona is in shambles. Anyway, uh, real briefly, uh, a little another interview. Team Taz was in the back, and they don't have any problems. According to Taz, Brian Cage apologized to him, apologized to Hook, apologized to Starks, apologized to Hobbs. And Brian Cage didn't look like he was very apologetic. And that was it. <laughs> <laughs> so last week he he basically scorned his teammates and put over their arch rival as as a great guy and then walked off and ignored his his friends and now it's told that he's apologized to everybody but he's standing there acting like he didn't apologize but he won't say anything uh then tony was at, at, did an interview with qt marshall who i thought it was wonderful not only wonderful, but romantic of QT Marshall to point out his wife in the crowd, his wife that he's been married to for years, his wife that they've known each other since they were eight years old. And I just wonder if his wife knows that QT was fucking the bunny about six months ago, wasn't he? He was with the bunny. I think the gimmick was she took his credit cards eventually and (laughs) because he was so in love with the bunny she was using him as as a fucking uh, as a pay slave and taking his credit cards and taking his money and he was a sap who was enamored of her and her upper frontal protuberances and her the scent of her minge and all those other type of things and just falling all over himself and she to become a heel scorned him I wonder how his wife felt about that. He said, there's my wife. The camera was on her. They were ready. Instantly. They were right on her. Instantly. And but yeah, but, but, stop. Go you, ahead. but you need to stop applying logic to the booking in AEW. It's something in the past. It's gone now. And we could just move on to well, QT you know, being the, the, the family man. The booker man. of the year is very logical. <laughs> uh, so then his promo is he's taking credit for a lot of the work. In AEW, these guys are so concerned about who's out working who and who's working hard. I think they ought to be working smart. But now he did a lot of the work in AEW. He works hard for Cody. He he's going to be up all night working hard for Cody, even though he never explained why that Cody's the work of Cody's assistant requires him to stay up all night. I don't I don't know what fuck business they're in. But this. This material and this whole premise is rotten, and it's just burying QT Marshall. He's obviously switching heel, and, but I don't believe his story. I don't believe his reasoning. This is set up, and he wants an exhibition match next week with Cody, so we might as well call him QT Zabisco. And then Cody comes out with his arm in a sling, his arm is in a sling, but he's accepting an exhibition match with a friend of his next week on television, and Arn Anderson will be the referee. You know what Vince McMahon used to call all this? Angle alert! We're telling you we're going to shoot something. Then Cody went forever accepting the exhibition. Con- Cody's response wasn't bad. QT was horrible because, for one thing, even though he can talk, there's nobody. I couldn't tell this story and make it sound plausible, the one that they gave him. So the reason for the challenge was shite, even if the acceptance of the challenge by Cody wasn't the worst thing I ever saw. But it, it, is he going to hit him over the head with a chair? What do you think? 
What you know the the problem is he gonna is he gonna he should have Larry Zabisco referee instead of fucking Arn because Zabisco made a ton of money off that angle. The problem with doing Zabisco and Bruno here is that Cody's not Bruno. <laughs> now Zabisco had been in and out of the territory since what 72 73 eight years and, and it was introduced and spent several years specifically as bruno's protege and everyone knew that story and everyone, had become a tag team champion when they started doing it on tv everyone knew the roles everyone knew that zabisco was bruno's student they he grew up in pittsburgh idolizing bruno he had had some success he had been a tag team champion with tony Gurria. and then the turn happened and the promos were great, but it also, it worked because it was Bruno. Right. We still don't understand exactly what Cody and QT's relationship is. We know that QT works very hard. Works very hard. They have the school. Cody's in the back with the headset on. He needs an assistant to help him with that. I think... Who's on headset? Bill! Bill's on headset. I don't know. I mean, we'll see how this works. Cody Rhodes... Maybe because his priorities are in other places, has been lost at sea as an on air character at least since the Brody Lee match. Because what has he done since then? The Shaq match, whatever you want to say about it, made no sense in the setup, made no sense in the execution, and then it was gone and it was over. Forgotten. Nothing with Cody has mattered in a long period of time. And I think we'll talk about what he's been doing during this period of time in a little bit. They're trying to make people care about QT. I could be wrong, but I don't think he's one of the AEW talents that the AEW fans really are invested in. He's a good wrestler, uh, but they've done nothing with him except make him a trainer flunky, trainer slash flunky. And then they give him a ridiculous reason to be upset at a guy and then telegraph that he's going to turn on this guy or there's going to be some breakup or whatever. Who knows? Maybe, maybe the swerve will be Arn goes with QT. I don't know. Who know? I don't know why anyone cares though. Well, I didn't say anybody cared. We're just trying to figure out what they're thinking. Cody still has that over the top entrance. Like he is the biggest superstar in the company. And obviously, he thinks of himself in that manner. And he tries to get his guys to work with him. Sean Spears was a Cody guy. QT Marshall is a Cody guy. But I have to say, because maybe he hasn't really done much since the TNT title run, and even during that run, you started hearing the whispers, I feel like a lot of the AEW hardcore fan base, not the people who listen to the Jim Cornette podcasts, because they want to hear someone else criticize AEW. The actual AEW hardcore fans, I feel like a lot of them are over Cody. And when you look at the other executive vice presidents, whether you like him or not, Kenny Omega constantly doing something. The Young Bucks constantly doing something. Constantly. And they're out there working as hard as they can for their style. What the hell has Cody been doing? What the hell has Cody been doing? And I think it's becoming clear to a lot of people that Cody and Brandy obviously see themselves as being one thing, but the AEW hardcore fan may not accept that and may not see them at that level right now. We will get to Cody's Bruno in this situation. I mean, really think about it. Cody is Bruno <laughs> in this situation. This guy who was a mid Carter for years and finally got elevated to another point with some of the things happening before AEW and AEW. Now, again, he latched on to the Young Bucks. So whatever credit for a lot of that stuff you want to give, it really goes to the Young Bucks, and then eventually Omega. But Cody latched on to what the Young Bucks I'm are doing. I'm not sure I'm giving a lot of credit for any Cody of Cody latched on to what the Young Bucks were doing. Cody really didn't matter much to New Japan, but they used him. Cody was in Ring of Honor, got a nice push. Everyone went crazy about that Dustin Rhodes match. And wow. Like this, that was the best thing Cody had ever done. Like this is what Cody could be. And then really look at what his career has been since that time. I don't know. I think that uh, he thinks a lot more of himself than the AEW fans are thinking of him right now. But time will tell. 
you're not trying to say that the Rhodes family is egotistical. We'll we'll talk. Dusty about it earned later. it. Dusty this, earned that. The, I wasn't talking about Dusty when I was mentioning the Rhodes family. I understand. Just, I'm just saying to compare apples to oranges. Yeah. Dusty Rhodes got over as a heel to the point where they had to turn him, and then he became a record-setting drawing card in his home territory and a major attraction everywhere else he went. Cody Rhodes elevated himself to a position when AEW started, I believe, out of some sort of jealousy that him and Brandy were sitting in the back and saying, why is it Triple H and Stephanie? That could be us. We can have these grand entrances. We can be the mom and pop of this organization. But I don't think anyone else sees them that way. Either they see themselves a certain way. I don't know if the AEW fans see them that way. And in terms of this angle where Cody is, I mean, QT's is probably the same age as Cody, been working just as long as Cody. <laughs> so it's not like Cody's the veteran here. It just, it makes no sense. And again, QT was just chasing the bunny. He was just chasing the bunny around. They were doing promos with Brandy and Dustin and QT and the bunny. And the bunny. And now it's, uh, here's my lovely wife in the audience. This is like when the Mongolian stomper gave a speech at the Night of Legends. I'd like to thank all the people in Knoxville. All of a sudden he could talk. QT I all of a sudden has a family. I wouldn't have let him done that if he'd have still been in the business full time anyway. QT all of a sudden has a family that the camera is on waiting for him to mention her. Ridiculous. Poorly executed. But we'll see where they go. Maybe... They do an interesting new version of the Bruno Zabisco match and angle. We'll see. And then we'll see if the AEW fans really get into a Cody QT Marshall feud. Maybe they'll divide up the nightmare family and he gets possession of Billy Gunn's kids and Cody gets Dustin. And then we'll see if anyone really cares about any of this. I don't know. I think when you look at what ha what's happening in AEW and the things that people care about and are getting traction, Cody's not really in that mix right now. Well, speaking of the other executive VPs, another six-man tag match for, for no apparent reason than we just want to have a bunch of six-man tag matches. Um, the Lucha Brothers and the Laredo Kid against the... Is it too early to say dumb fucks on YouTube? And, uh, yep. and they're... They're, yep, it sure is. And their their little friend Brandon Cutlet. What? <sighs> okay, now the Lucha Brothers are back together. I thought Felix and Pac were a team, and Penthouse was a single heel. Felix and Pac, the last time I saw them, they were baby faces. Now Felix and Penthouse are back together, but they're apparently heels because they're going against the 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 dumb fucks and cutlet that are apparently baby faces and also the lucha brothers and laredo kid had the heel interpreter who is the best of the bunch of them and this was just an excuse for all the kids to go out and play on their trampoline this looked like the june taylor dancers in a riot with two seventh grade students and their dull-witted pal that got left back two grades and I, I can't watch this fake-ass Mexican square dancing that they insist on doing. In the UFC, they make the video games look like the fights, but when these fucking clowns get in the ring, they make the fights look like the video games. And it's just, it's just the same thing over and over, and they might love this shit in Tijuana. And, I'm, you know, maybe some of the AEW faithful like to see a bunch of grown men doing cheerleading routines but for the average viewer of a wrestling match this is gaka garbage gaka they all took turns jumping off high shit and catching each other and finally they went to a break and i took the opportunity to, to not come back on the the next segment and skip the second half of it it was basically a million dives and flips and finally, Laredo Kid backflipped Cutlet off the top rope and one, two, three. It never changes. What did Dusty say in that, pro in that promo? If you follow a, the view, 
never changes. It never changes. But well, the match in AEW never changes, baby. Except in this case, they had an afterbirth. That's different. We only have an afterbirth on three quarters of the AEW matches. Olivier comes out and jumps the Laredo kid and beats him up and whacks one of the other luchas and then did his phone sex promo where he never actually completes a sentence. He just blurts out a lot of random words and in a, the breathy fashion. And he confronted, was I watching this? Brian, tell me if I was watching this and I'm correct about this. He confronted the Bucks yet again over their lost friendship, their love gone wrong. They've spurned him. He went crazy and was the hyperventilating Marx brother mad because they would, they, you've got to too sweet me right now. It's like a lover's quarrel. These are not men, they're children fighting over who's cut who out of friendship. So the hyperventilating Marx brother and the two smarmy punks from Cucamonga are arguing over whether they should too sweet each other or not. And every gas station mechanic in fucking America is going, I wish somebody just bend these two over and just fuck them all. Um, what? Just, just, then the Bucks walk out on Twinkle Toes with, we can't figure out whose side we're supposed to be on in this. It's a, just a, a, a bunch of annoying people speaking to each other. And the Bucks walk off, and then the Lucha Brothers jump back on Olivier and lay him out. So nobody ever has the fucking last word. They just, if, if, if the guy who beat up another guy, if he stays out there long enough, the guy that got beat up will come back and beat him up in the same segment. I didn't understand any of this. What were your thoughts? Uh, in terms of the match... You know, Brandon Cutler can do a lot of the moves that everyone else seems to be able to do, a lot of the high-flying moves, but boy, does he not look like a wrestler. He's really skinny. There's nothing intimidating about him. There's nothing that stands out about him. He doesn't seem special compared to anyone else who does all the same things he does. And it's clear that he's only there because he's friends with the Young Bucks. I think AEW loves tournaments. They should have a tournament of the friends. <laughs> and just have everyone's charity hire Dr. Luther and Brandon Cutler and QT Marshall and Sean Spears and everyone else, all the people that are only there because of who their friends are, and have a tournament amongst them to find out who really is the best friend. The best friend. You know, other than that, I, you know, I get a kick out of Ray Phoenix. I have to admit, I get a kick out of watching him. The post match. I was surprised when all of a sudden Omega got his ass kicked by the Lucha Brothers, and apparently they busted his mouth because he was bleeding. I don't, I don't know what to think of all this. Like you said, who's the face? Who's the heel? It's hard for me to believe that the Young Bucks are baby faces because they act like heels. You know, Nick Jackson just has no charisma at all. He just seems like you would think that if they weren't the sober brothers that Nick Jackson was just stoned all the time sitting there. He never really reacts would, or says would anything. That be an excuse for his dull-witted look and his lack of any personality whatsoever. Yeah, he has nothing. And then Matt Jackson, everything he says comes across like a little brat, like a little heelish brat. Yeah. But then Omega's in there clearly being a heel. <laughs> I don't know why anyone's supposed to care about any of this. This has been laid out so poorly from day one. You know, on the indie scene, they were the elite. This group of Omega and the Bucks, and I guess you could even say Cody and Adam Page, who was in New Japan. But nothing's really been done with any of that in AEW. So the average person who doesn't read The Observer may have no idea what's going on with any of these idiots. Well, speaking of idiots, the time that you've been waiting for, because we teased this earlier in the show here, but this was where they played the spot of the new 
Brody and Candy reality television program. No, Cody and Brandy. <laughs> I just wanted, Brody and Candy. I just wanted to say it like that. You know why. Social climbers. I would be circumcised with a loose shark's tooth before I would do a reality TV show where they let cameras in your house and film your personal life. And th this is, they have been lusting after this and wanting this. They, you hit it on the head earlier. Apparently they don't care about wrestling now. They think they're going to be regular old celebrities, uh, regular celebrities, not just because they're celebrities because they're in something that they do semi-well or co in Cody's case. They're just going to be celebrities on TV because that's what everybody's goal in life to be is now. What's the what's the show called? What it, ah, fuck, I forgot to write down the title of it. We're desperate. <laughs> no, I believe it's called Roads to the Top. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. So now they have they have suckered this poor billionaire who just desperately wanted to have live action figures to play with into installing them on this so they could get in with TNT and Cody gets on a game show and now they've got a reality show. Like anybody wants to watch any fucking reality show, much less one about Brody and Candy. And here we go. And more ways to expose the wrestling business and tell people how it really works. And, but well, if they knew how it really worked, how they work it, um, this can't miss. This is going to be a fucking abortion all the way around. I'm sure Brandy's going to have a ton of fun. Oh, I guarantee you she's been waiting for this. He's been waiting for this. This is what they want. I've said it from the beginning. Cody Rhodes fell back onto wrestling. His goal was never to be a wrestler. It was never to follow in his father's footsteps. He wanted to be an actor. And it didn't work. Now, this is what they've got. You know, AEW have this relationship with TNT. And you would think with AEW and TNT's relationship and TNT launching that Go Big Show, it's a great opportunity to take a wrestler you have and maybe get them in front of a new audience and get them over. And naturally, that wrestler was Cody, who has done almost nothing on that show in the last six months, maybe longer. And now there's going to be a reality show. Same thing. It's Cody and Brandy. Every AEW fan hates Brandy because they realize she's been stuffed down their throats from day one. The Nightmare Collective, her and Kong cutting people's <laughs> hairs, baby face turn, heel turn, back and forth. She's a valet. She's storming to the ring in, in Cody's defense. She's, she's a side. I mean, just one thing, baby announcement, gender reveal. These things weren't done for the AEW fans. They were done for the ego of Cody and Brandy who desperately want to be Triple H and Stephanie, period. And this is so silly. I don't know if we have to watch this and review it. No, no, but... no, we don't. No, I'm, draw I'm making up any kind of rule I need to make up about reality television programs. But this is, this is what they wanted. It's, you know, whatever. The Spencer Pratt and his girlfriend of fucking AEW. Who? Uh, you know, reality suckers from other shows. Okay. This is just pathetic. And again, this is one of those things where I saw AEW fans up in arms. You know, what is this? <laughs> Why would they do this? We don't want this. And again, Cody doesn't really care what the fans think. It's what Cody and Brandy want to do. Uh, they are in Atlanta. I wonder how many episodes before DDP shows up to start <laughs> doing an infomercial for his Wait a minute, show. bada boom, bada bing, DDP, the founder and operator and manipulator of DDPY, which is what? Not yoga, because it ain't just fucking yoga or whatever. Yeah, I, I guarantee he'll show up on that show wearing a DDP yoga shirt within like the first six episodes. He can't, but he can't do the whole cameo promo because it's only going to be a 30 minute show. I think, look, Cody at times has done stuff right. And you can't take any. I was away. a huge fan. He was the only one I had any faith in when this thing started. And that came crashing down after a number of months. You can't take anything away from him putting his body on the line from blading to, 
mishaps like the chair and when he dove onto the ramp and he did the moonsault off the top of the cage. But this show and so much of what Cody and Brandy have been in AEW is tone deaf. It's tone deaf to their audience and what people really want. It's not about what wrestling fans want. It's about what Cody and Brandy want. And this is why, you know, I, I don't know. I'll give it maybe. I've been pretty good with my AEW bets with my friends. You know, Tony Khan being an on-air character. I still have another, I think, uh, several months before he has to start sleeping with one of the on-air performers. Cheerleaders <laughs> count. Jaguar cheerleaders count. Uh, someone, I was thinking about doing one about him going to rehab within a couple of years, but I don't know if we'll do that. But I'll bet you we're a year to 18 months away from all of the legitimate problems between the executive vice presidents coming out and being open warfare, where all of a sudden, let's just say Omega and the Bucks say, what the hell is Cody doing? You know, there's a complete disconnect. And we'll see. I think we're going to have an internal warfare within 18 months. Well, hopefully it'll be more exciting than the rest of the program. Maybe they'll televise that. What do you think? But I mean, I'm saying that they're tone deaf. What do you think looking at this show and this commercial and the way Cody has been used and the way Brandy has been used on this show. What are your thoughts? I think that that Cody is already looking past wrestling and wants to be a celebrity. And I think that wrestling has already looked past Brandy and she doesn't give a shit. She just wants to be on TV. And Brandy. So, yeah. Uh, I, mean, I mean, let's face it. Brandy was a limited wrestler at best and nobody is encouraging her to do more of it. So how else is she going to be on TV and be a star? I, but, it, but yeah, and I'm like you, you know, these people have few similarities. They got stuck in the bullet club thing, which led to the elite, which led to them temporarily getting over with a niche audience, which led to them getting this deal. But that doesn't mean they can work together or think the same way or like each other. They like all their friends, but the, all their friends are not necessarily all the people in the Bullet Club or whatever. Um, I'm wondering who, speaking of friends, why do Nyla Rose nor Vicky Guerrero have no friends? <laughs> Apparently. Why, why, why can't Nyla Rose win a match? I was about to say, they got no friends. They want to bury these two. And I'm going to tell you what I've seen on Twitter yesterday before I tell you what I saw in this match real briefly they've got a beach towel now dedicated to the vicious vixens Nyla Rose and Vicky Guerrero where they are on the beach posing in bikinis and they are selling this as a piece of merchandise now besides the fact that they have botched Nyla Rose completely since the start. Nyla Rose could have been the monster heel center of the AEW women's wheel, but that opportunity was lost a long time ago when they beat her constantly, booked her like an idiot, and had her sell for all of Olivier's fetish objects. And Vicky Guerrero has a name, obviously, from WWE television. She was featured prominently, and all she's done is is come out, cut a few short pre-tape promos, and stand in a corner like every other legend they turn into a manager, and don't let them do any of the manager things that managers do. And now they think that of everybody on their women's roster, the way to market Nyla Rose, the 200 and some odd pound Native American beast, and Vicky Guerrero, not to even insult this nice lady, but why put a 50-something-year-old woman in a bikini and they're the two they were going to sell bikini towels of? What the fuck? <clears throat> so in this match, Nyla Rose against Ty Conti, who is now babyface and she's in the Dark Order, and, I mean, I was running late because I knew what was going to happen. I said, Nyla Rose is going to do a job and there's going to be an afterbirth. Guess what? <laughs> she, Ty Conti hit some very awkward knees and a DDT and beat Nyla Rose one, two, three. And then and they had an afterbirth. 
and the beast took over on the 100-pound blonde cheerleader that just kicked her ass and went for a power bomb, but had to wait because Sheeta was late. Sheeta comes out and beats Rose's ass. And then here comes the bunny for some reason. But there's a tag team match next week. That's the reason. That's the booking reason. But there's no reason in storyline why Bunny should have just run out and grabbed a kendo stick and just wailed the shit out of everybody. So Bunny, the most unintimidating physical specimen of the bunch of these, just came out and just fucking laid waste to everybody. And then... Well, she's having a rough night. QT's wife showed up. Well, that's true. But then Matt Hardy and the Butcher and the Baker were on the stage starting to cut a promo. But instead, Matt just made a flat statement about the bunny, and then they all stood there. Just the the women's title tournament wasn't what it could have been because the bunny wasn't in it. That was it. Right? Did my audio go out? Did I miss something? I don't think so. I wasn't paying too close of attention to this segment. This was kind of the bathroom break segment where they get all the bathroom break wrestlers out there yeah. all at once. <laughs> but uh, it sounds about right. I just wanted to make sure. All right. And moving on real quickly, we're almost to the main event. But they did a package with Pockets and Chucklefuck and Bluto and Pip Sabian and the Virgin Penelope Ford. And... <sighs> They were each speaking in clips and everything. It was like you took five fan participation contest winners and stuck them in front of a camera and said, okay, you say this because you're playing wrestler now. That's what you won in the contest. And the main event of this incredible effort of television for the TV title, Long John Silver against Darby Allen. Silver, of course, the vertically challenged comedy underneath goofy babyface member of the dork order. So we had the goofy gimmick babyface versus the brooding skateboarding babyface. Why were we supposed to want to see anyone win this? Do we want to see Darby Allen, the brooding, skateboarding babyface, beat the shit out of the fucking goofy, fun-loving, gimmick-smiling babyface? Or do we want to see the goofy, gimmick-smiling babyface kick the shit out of the brooding, under underdog, skateboarding babyface? And Sting, it was noted, was somewhere at the start of the match watching Darby Allen's back against baby faces, against a baby face group. So he is going to make sure that Darby Allen is not attacked, beaten, assaulted, sodomized, whatever, by the wacky, ice cream-loving dork order. And this is the TV main event, and they get started with 15 minutes left on the air. Having said all that about how this match should have never taken place and they both should have been wrestling different people and the booking is atrocious, Darby Allen's body language in selling is not just good, it's remarkable. And the abandon in which he throws himself into things, including the dives, which we've said he's the only one who makes dives out of the ring actually look real and look good. He doesn't seem to be reckless when he works except with himself. He's not dangerous to other people necessarily that I can tell. He's got a lot of appeal. If I was running a company today, and we're going to do a mental masturbation exercise here sometime on one of these programs coming up and pick my modern roster that I would sign if I could from any and all companies. I would sign Darby Allen to a contract with a clause that specifically said that as long as he worked for me and I was pushing him as a main event wrestling attraction and a champion or in the title picture and using him prominently on my wrestling show, that he would not be allowed to do 
any of the stupid, reckless things that he does outside wrestling for free just because he has a death wish or whatever his mental problem is. Because if I'm going to tie up a bunch of TV time and effort and promotion and thought of booking and money in promoting a guy and he's going to go out and jump off something for shits and grins and break his fucking leg. If I can get to the other one, he's going to have two broken legs. If I'm the promoter. So I would sign him to a contract based on that. If he did any skateboarding or bridge jumping or truck dragging or whatever the things are, he does for a hobby, because I guess nobody just sits around watching porn and jacks off anymore. Uh, that that would nullify the contract. Anyway, um, apparently Silver took a bump over the guardrail and hurt his arm. I've heard it may be injured for real, but hopefully not seriously. Um, they did a nice spot where Darby Allen went to do a dive and Silver moved out of the way, and Darby Allen hit the wrong guy. Laid him out too. He, he him hits out. his yeah. dives better than he hits anyone. His dives. But he hit a member of the Dark Order, so that's when Sting came out. Sting came out to watch Darby Allen's back because Darby Allen is the one who just hit a member of the Dark Order who's standing there minding his own business, waiting for a fucking train, and got hit with one. And that brings Sting out with a baseball bat. He walks out, calmly threatens no one, but everyone runs away from him. And they're all baby faces now. So six or seven Dark Order members who are allegedly baby faces ran from one 61-year-old guy with a baseball bat that wasn't threatening them in any way. Um, Darby Allen works hard. Silver's good. They're just small and they have him acting goofy, which makes him stand out, which is what he wants, but you can't take him seriously, so they shouldn't put him in a main event because he's not a top guy because he's an underneath goofy guy. Um, and finally, at, at, they're going home. Darby Allen has silver down in the middle of the ring and climbs up to the top rope and coffin drops the group on the floor for no fucking reason. They weren't trying to interfere. They didn't do anything. The guy's opponent was in the ring down he climbs to the top rope to finish off the opponent and instead jumps backwards oh and it gets a big pop because you didn't expect it you know what else would get a big pop because i didn't expect it if i get up tomorrow morning and i walk and i open my front door and there's a pink rhinoceros wearing a fucking green polka dotted hat and carrying flowers i wouldn't expect that either but some explanation would be required so anyway he coffin drops the floor on the the floor on the group, the group on the floor. Then Silver, of course, takes back over because Darby took his eye off the opponent, gives Darby Allen a big bump off the top rope. And that was a leg on the rope uh, two count. And then Darby Allen reverses a power bomb into a sunset flip thing. Boom, one, two, three. He won as we knew he would. And guess what happened, Brian? Afterbirth. Afterbirth! <sighs> Again! It, it, as Sting sleepwalks into the ring to stand by Darby Allen, Darby and Silver do a little fist bump, and suddenly Matt Hardy on the floor jerks Darby Allen out, runs him into the fucking barricade, and at the same time, 15 guys jump into the ring and start a big brawl to go off the air. Now, I couldn't tell who was fighting, and they didn't manage their time very well, because if they didn't go off the air within seconds after this, my DVR froze up because it was top of the hour, so it didn't last long. But when Matt Hardy pulled Darby Allen out and ran him into the goddamn barricade, the only heels out there were Matt Hardy and the Butcher and the Baker. Because the Dark Order and Darby Allen and Sting, all of them were just... Darby Allen made up with John Silver and fist bumped him. Sting's just standing there wondering when the bank opens tomorrow so he can cash that check. And But just everybody just got in a big fight, even people that shouldn't be mad at each other because they were all out there fighting. What the fuck was going on? 
I don't have any answers. I hate <laughs> I hate the idea that they would bring Darby Allen into a feud with any one of the Matt Hardy stable. <sighs> uh, I, well, I mean, it it doesn't necessarily mean that's going to happen because goodness knows they don't follow up on a lot of other shit. But who is it that's saying that all of this stuff is stuff is so deep and long and drawn out and planned ahead and and thought out so and laid out and carefully orchestrated and there's callbacks these that they just do shit on the sperm of the moment and forget about it the next day i.e qt when pointing out his wife forgetting that he was fucking the bunny six months ago so i don't know where they get the idea that this is some intricate agatha christie novel that they're writing here and that was aew well there you have it folks <laughs> i got to get started on Cornette's Collectibles. We're going to be back same time, same day, Tuesday on the drive through and we will be back next week, Saturday, on the experience. And in between, I will be trying to send out everybody's packages. The Cornette's Collectibles store may be, may be suspended for sale, but if you've sent me money, you're going to get your shit eventually. You can rest assured of that. Just have some pity and give me some time. And uh, Brian, any final thoughts? Another fun drive through coming up this week. Well, that was a, that may have been a thought, but it certainly wasn't any fun. No. Folks, until then, <laughs> for Cameo and, and Cornette's Collectibles and the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel and all the people involved in all of these things, thank you and fuck you, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye, everybody.